Okay. All right, so first up, site plan review application for Meadowbrook, Meadowbrook Golf Club. <laughs> Andrew, do you want to update us or do we want the applicant to just jump right in? Um, I think so. This was a. So, hold on. Before we get started, I'm sorry. There is a public notice to be read, and also uh, I think I'm supposed to state that the, um, the associate member would have rights to vote on this application if uh, one of the other members wasn't present. I'm not quite sure how to word that other than that. Right, so, so you have the associate member is present as long as he's present at all of the meetings and one of the other members dropped out, the associate member could vote on this. But he won't be voting tonight. But he will not be voting tonight. Right. As long as the other the full time members are available to vote, yeah, associate member does not vote. When I say that again for the next <laughs> <laughs> Notice is hereby given that pursuant to sections 4.3 and 4.6 of the Town of Reading Zoning Bylaw, the Community Planning and Development Commission will hold a public hearing on Monday, June 11, 2018 at 8 p.m. 8 p.m. That means a lot. what it says? Yeah, this is all wrong. Is this the one that went out? I think we got the wrong version. Did you get the wrong version? Do you have any second? Little notice. Oh, 5.30. That's why. Monday, June 11th. That's the one you've got. I'm just checking on the drive. Yeah, you could. Sorry. It's Technical difficulties. Yeah. We just pulled the wrong file. Yeah, I pulled the wrong file. I'm sorry. The one that actually went out said, okay, so. Yeah. Um, what it actually said <coughs> was we'll hold a public hearing on Monday, uh, July 8th at 7.30 p.m. And this is so what? It's July 9th. Oh, today July, 9th. Is July 9th. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ms. Lutton's meeting room, uh, Reading Town Hall, 16 Lowell Street, to, be con uh, to consider the application for a site plan review to construct a new clubhouse and make associated site improvements submitted by Meadowbrook Golf Club for land located at 292, also known, known as 288 Grove Street, Assessor's Map 37, Lot 4 in Reading, Massachusetts. A copy of the application and associated plans are available to the public in the Public Services Department in Town Hall on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. and on Tuesday from 7.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. Thanks. Okay. <coughs> So I think the applicants can take over, as you've heard, they're proposing to raise the existing clubhouse and come up with a new one, um, almost similar size and style, same use. So they were before us, I believe, in the fall or winter, and it's a similar application, but I'll let them explain the differences and what's new. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, members of the Commission. For the record, my name is Brian McGrail. I'm an attorney with offices at 599 North Avenue in Wakefield, Massachusetts, and I'm here representing Meadowbrook Golf Club uh, in their efforts to raise their existing clubhouse uh, and replace it with one of similar size, similar nature, and almost identical location. Um, with me tonight on behalf of Meadowbrook is Kevin Roche. Kevin is the president of the club. Uh, also, uh, here on behalf of uh, Meadowbrook is Jack Sullivan, who is our uh, site civil engineer, and Andrew Weaver is our architect. Uh, they will all be participating uh, in our presentation to your permission tonight. As Andrew mentioned, uh, this has been uh, somewhat of a long, winding road uh, for Meadowbrook to get uh, to this point, to hopefully start uh, to commence on the construction of the new clubhouse. Uh, it was an idea that Kevin will get into more detail uh, after me, kind of, of, of you know, how it evolved and, and the thought process that went into that. Um, but it started uh, at this commission back in the fall of 2017. And at that time, uh, they submitted plans, they submitted an application for site plan approval, like we are here for tonight. Uh, also, with that, was submitted an application for a special permit. Um, after looking at the plan, I believe they went through maybe one hearing. Uh, we decided uh, to take a step back, uh, redo the plan a little bit, um, uh, but certain aspects of it. 
uh, and also to take a look at the permitting procedures. Um, what we determined was with our new plan that there would be no special permit requirement. Uh, we approached the, the uh, folks in the planning department. Uh, we explained our position in that regard that we did not believe that a special permit would be required for our new plan. Uh, they uh, proceeded to vet that uh, very thoroughly. Uh, they actually spoke with the town council in that regard uh, in detail and uh, it was determined that no special permit uh, is required for our, process, our project. Hence. The only application that we are seeking uh, tonight is for a site plan approval. What you're going to uh, see tonight is basically, as I mentioned, the raising of the existing structure, the clubhouse, uh, which currently does not comply with the dimensional requirements of the zoning bylaw. It does not meet the front setback requirements. It's only approximately 16 feet from Grove Street. And what we're proposing to reconstruct will be a new clubhouse uh, that will meet all of the dimensional requirements of the bylaw, actually uh, pulling it back. Uh, it will be a state-of-the-art facility. It will provide uh, proper handicap access uh, for everybody up to today's standards. And it will be, uh, as I mentioned, a state-of-the-art uh, facility. Um, I'm sure your commission is aware of uh, the standards of site plan review versus special permit. Site plan review is more of a review aspect um, for you know reasonable conditions as it may relate uh, to the project, um, but not uh, special permit standards that would normally be required under Mass General Laws Chapter uh, 40A. Um, I also would like to point out that as part of this process, uh, Meadowbrook has um, reached out to the neighborhood um, and uh, have had meetings. Uh, we've had meetings with some specific neighbors that I've actually been involved in and their council has been involved. Um, we actually uh, have come up with ideas um, as far as uh, solving some of the concerns that they may have, uh, suggested those. And I think it's important to note that you know our plans, uh, even though we don't think that they're totally satisfied, our plans are reflective of what we told them that we could do. So it wasn't like do this or, or support us and we're, and we're not going to, we're going to you know, take these things away. Everything that we put out there that we thought would be helpful to the neighborhood, that listening to their concerns has been implemented in the plans uh, in, in, our, uh, in the plans uh, today. Um, with that said, if I may, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Kevin Roach, who's the president. I should mention that uh, I think the majority of the folks that are here tonight uh, are members. Uh, as you'll hear from Kevin, this is a uh, long-standing club in the town of Reading, over 100 years, uh, who have a significant number of Reading residents. And it's the pride of Meadowbrook to consistently give back uh, to the community. So in many respects, uh, the clubhouse that we are trying to build or rebuild for Meadowbrook, in many aspects, it's a community facility because so many people within the town of Reading actually utilize it. So with that being said, Kevin. Thank you, Brent. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to spend a little bit of time. I just want to give a quick background on Meadowbrook for some people who may not be familiar with it, talk a little bit about the facts of the project, and then we'll turn it over to Jack Sullivan, uh, who will go through some of the engineering pieces. As Brian mentioned, Meadowbrook is a privately owned uh, golf course. It's 120 years old. We have golf, pool, and tennis at the club operating in Reading, Mass. The course was de designed by a gentleman named Alexander Finley. If you're involved with the golf community, you recognize that name. It's been a name that has been involved with designing courses. And we're very privileged to be able to have one of the toughest nine-hole private golf courses in Massachusetts. We've appreciated the strong relationship with the town over this time, over these past 100 years plus. And the facilities are used by some of Reading High sports teams and with some of our town functions, some of the town functions as well as a gift from the club. The membership, as Brian mentioned, is about approximately 70% Reading residents. And over the past five years, annually, we've raised about $75,000 a year on various charity events around cancer, um, kids getting involved with golf, uh, veterans, et cetera, as a big, big part of what the uh, Meadowbrook community is about. We're also proud of the Women's Golf Program, which is recognized as one of the best in New England. And we have a strong girls and boys programs in both golf, pool, and tennis that we're very proud of as we think about the next generation of members to come through Meadowbrook. We've made significant investments. This is not the only one uh, on, over the years at the club in our irrigation system and most recently our maintenance facility that allows us to properly handle the things that we're doing on the golf course that's not only a benefit for the club, but also a benefit for the surrounding area. And at the core of the club is our clubhouse. It's a 70 plus year old structure. 
uh, it does today. It's lockers, showers, dining, and a social experience it provides for the membership. And it's an important element of the social aspect of the club itself. As Brian mentioned, this project began about two, two and a half years ago. We began a thoughtful process as board. We had some concerns about the current structure of the clubhouse and the, um, the additional kind of enhancements to it. Um, we found some challenges with the current structure that we have today. We formed a clubhouse advisory team, uh, members of the club who had been in the development business for a number of years, basically over 150 years of experience on that team, and they became our advisors as we went through this process. We also hired professionals in both the design and development, people who have been involved in designing other clubhouses for other golf courses in and around the Massachusetts and New England area. And as the board went through this process with the external advisors and internal advisors, we looked at all the options of the clubhouse location and whether we should build or renovate our, our uh, building. And after many, many dis uh, discussions as a board, we decided that the right thing to do for us was to build a new clubhouse. We discussed this many times with our membership uh, as we went through this process, and by a wide margin, this was approved by the membership of Meadowbrook. And I do want to take a moment to acknowledge that we have a number of members of the Meadowbrook Club, as well as some of my board members, fellow board members, here in the room, and I appreciate them coming out to support the project that we're involved with. A, a few facts about the project. Uh, the building is in a very similar location, but as we've designed this building, we've taken um, great concerns about where we want certain parts and elements of the building, particularly the outside areas. We have taken the building and turned it so our outside areas are now facing our property. Today, they're closer to the Grove Street area. We think that, that was a step in the right direction, not only for our members, but also for the surrounding area as well. Meadowbrook will remain a nine-hole golf pool tennis club. We're not looking to expand. Um, we're not looking to go beyond that. That's our current scope, and that will be our scope as we go forward. The clubhouse design was built to be a nine-hole course. Our membership levels have remained steady over the last 15 years. So we designed the clubhouse to basically sit with the goal and objective of being a nine-hole golf pool and tennis club and basically at membership levels that we see today. Um, the, the clubhouse itself is basically the same square footage as it's currently uh, in place today. And we have a current curb cut that will basically remain the same where our current driveway is in place today. We've had several meetings with the Butters and with town departments over the last nine months to get input to our plans. That <coughs> input was important as we gave you the final pictures. Um, we did make some changes to our original plan as we submitted this new application around sound, driveway, trash, and drainage areas that we think are improvements to the plan that we submitted back in August. And just for a point of reference, the club operates today and will continue to operate in kind of two seasons. Our off season is November through March time period, and our main season is April through October. Um, and in summary, I just wanted to say thank you for taking the time. Um, you'll hopefully get the chance to hear from Jack and Andrew a little bit on the engineering pieces and the architectural pieces, and then certainly open up for any questions or comments. So, so I think Brian will yeah. turn over to Jack and do hand over to Jack. Thank you. Uh, for the record, my name is Jack Sullivan. I'm owner of the Sullivan Engineering Group. And just to add on to uh, what the two previous speakers uh, addressed, we also had a development review team meeting with town staff a couple weeks ago, and we're presently in front of the Conservation Commission with a request for determination of applicability. Uh, we, we had applied back in the fall to the Conservation Commission. We continued those hearings, and we reopened them about three to four weeks ago, and we have not closed with them yet. We wanted to come to CPDC, get feedback from you, and then we'll be going back to conservation to hopefully close out with them. Um, just to bring everyone up to speed, and most people know this, but I'm uh, hoping everyone can see. Um, the existing site entrance is here. As uh, Kevin stated, the, ex the existing curb cut will remain the same for the proposed building. Uh, everyone will remember back from the fall, even though this is a new application, we had an entrance further over this way. Um, it, it was decided it was best to locate it where the existing entrance is uh, for a number of reasons uh, based on discussions and input with, with the butters and uh, decision was made to keep it in that location. Uh, soil testing was performed on the site with um, oversight from the engineering department. Uh, the soils on site are sand, sand and gravels. Uh, very good for drainage, uh, highly permeable. 
Um, the site itself is 60 acres. The front portion of the site is located within the S20 zoning district. Uh, the rear portion is within the S40 zoning district. Um, and the state of the entire site is within the Aquifer Protection District. Um, off to the left of the site entrance is a wetland that was delineated by Norse Environmental Services. Um, the majority of the work is outside of the Conservation Commission's jurisdiction, which is one of, with, with, within 100 feet of the wetland area. Uh, but there is some minor work within the 100 feet, and that's why we're in front of the commission. Uh, as the attorney, um, Brian Grail, stated, the existing building is about 16 feet off of Grove Street, which is non-conforming. You need 20 feet in the S20 zoning district for a front setback. The new building will be over 30 feet back, so it'll be more conforming and fitting with the S20 zoning district. Um, would you mind going to the site plan slide? Mm -hmm. okay. So this is a proposed site plan, and you can see for reference for the board members and the public, the light gray is the existing building footprint. The darker footprint here is the proposed clubhouse. And so you can see it's in relatively the same location. Same with the entrance. Here's the existing entrance. The proposed curb cuts in the same general location, and it'll be 24 feet wide, which meets the engineering and DPW requirements, not having a curb cut exceeding 24 feet in width. So we'll be in compliance with that regulation. Um, one of the main design um, elements that we tried to put in is we're going to have an island, and there'll be a drop-off area to the club. And that drop-off area is more for um, elderly um, members or people who are visiting the club. Um, they can come into this lower level. Also, it will serve as um, deliveries for the club. We're proposing a loading space right in this location. And that way, vehicles can come in, drop off materials, and circle out. And general club members will park up in, in the existing uh, parking lot that, that you see today. Um, can you go to the grading drainage for utility? Okay. Oops. Okay, so this, this is our grading drainage and utility plan. Um, one big thing to note is the existing clubhouse and the, the roof porches will all be hard piped to a drainage infiltration field that's situated here. This infiltration field has been sized to store and infiltrate the 100-year storm event. And the footprint of the clubhouse and the porches is about 8,300 square feet. So it's important for the board to note that we are increasing impervious surfaces by about 2,800 square feet for this project. That increase is mainly due to this circular drop-off area that I talked about previous. But we're taking out over 8,000 square feet of impervious through the clubhouse and the porch roof areas being conveyed to this infiltration field. Uh, so with the drainage analysis I did, there'll be a 28% reduction in stormwater coming off this site from existing conditions to proposed conditions. With that said, even though we're making a significant reduction, uh, there's also been some concerns with sheet flow coming off this this parking lot out onto Grove Street. That's been noted by the Conservation Commission, the town engineer, and back in the fall we talked about it as well. Uh, so what we're proposing to do in this, this plan will be revised somewhat. But the idea is to have a trench drain placed right at the entrance to the site, and there'll be an outlet to a rain garden, and then there'll be an emergency overflow from that rain garden through a riprap spreader out towards the wetland. Uh, Conservation Commission likes the idea of the rain garden, uh, but it's one concern that the town engineer had and, and our Conservation Commission meeting came up as well is there was a concern that due to the slope and the amount of water that comes off this hill, this trench drain could get overwhelmed and water would still go up to Grove Street. So they asked me to look at that and try to come up with some solutions. So. Our last parking space is about in this area here. I'm going to look to create an island. I have enough room. There's about 29 feet in width across our trailway. I'm going to create an island. 
and put a catch basin right here with an outlet to this rain garden. And right now, with that 29 feet, I can take some of the pavement area, out, pavement area out, create a little bit larger rain garden. I'm going to do an analysis showing there's a high point in the parking lot somewhere up in here. I actually did some survey work today to figure out exactly where it is. And I'm going to demonstrate. I'm going to do an analysis showing um, how much water is coming down. That'll get to this catch basin and move out to the rain garden, and then whatever we get moving across to this trench drain. Right now, the trench drain is only eight inches wide. I'm going to look for more of a, a commercial application, maybe an 18-inch wide trench drain. But by adding a catch basin with a deep sump further up gradient from that trench drain, I'll provide another method of collecting storm water instead of just sending all the water directly to that trench drain. So, that's something I talked with the town engineer on it. I'm going to set an appointment with him this week to go through it. Uh, but I, I just want to note to the board that even without the trench drain, we're making significant improvements. The existing condition, the existing clubhouse drains directly out onto the paved areas. All but one downspout discharges directly onto the parking lot. There's no formal drainage system. So with, with this system, with the infiltration field I'm showing, we're making a tremendous improvement. So just, Jack, yeah. sorry, can you just elaborate on the island? Are you talking about putting it in the middle of the drive or to the no, side? Can you yeah, draw it on there with a marker yeah, or something? Yeah, can you go to the site? Yeah. 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 I can use all these markers. In the yeah. 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 So, Put a narrowing and I'll move so everyone can see that spot. This is the last parking space here. I'm able to, right at the end of this parking space, I'm gonna add vertical granite curving right here, and this will become green space. This will become the island. Right at the back of this parking space, I'll have a catch basin. Right now, this parking lot is super elevated, meaning it's higher over here, lower over here, and it drains right to left, right to left. It'll come down, go to the catch basin, I'll put a, a, a manhole here, and then we'll pipe it to this rain garden. So I'll be able to create some green space in that location. So therefore, right now where, if the high point's up in this area, all this is draining out, we'll capture this upper lot here, this lower lot will still go to the trench drain, but I'm gonna try to find a trench drain that's about 18 inches in width instead of eight inches in width. It'll be a dramatic improvement. So that will be one of the big design changes. The engineer provided a memo. It, it, it might you have it in, in your packets. Relatively minor in comments. The main thing was to look at this part of the drainage. It's something I feel I could easily achieve. So you're still going to maintain what kind of width at that point right there? And so I'll still maintain 24 feet. Okay. Right now there's 29. So I'll still have two-way traffic width of 24. Um, <coughs> Can you go back to the grading plan for one minute later? And I'll just hit on a couple other things briefly, but one of the main things would be the image. I'll erase that. So okay, as far as utilities, there'll be new water service to the building that will be for domestic water and fire protection. There'll be a new sewer service to the building. The club will utilize propane. They talked with the gas company. They're looking to extend gas to the clubhouse. Uh, haven't been met with too great of a response from the gas company on that at this time. But it's something in the future that they'll still look to pursue. But at this point, it will be propane. Um, as far as uh, a dumpster and recycling area, that's going to be to the rear of the property, out by their storage facility. Um, so all all trash and recycling will be brought to the rear of the snow uh, rear of the facility. Also, snow storage that will all be that's where they do it now towards the back of the site where the storage building is. Um, that's basically the, the utilities and the drainage and how we're looking to deal with trash and, and snow storage for the site. I think at this time I'll turn it over to Andrew and I'll gladly come back up if anyone has any questions. Hi everyone. 
my name is Andrew Weaver, Weaver Associates Architects, and what I'd like to do is run through some of the, uh, the plans and foundations of the proposed new clubhouse. Guys, okay. This is the, the lower floor of the clubhouse. You can see the drop off circle is right here. There's a main entrance and kept accessible entrance here to an elevator. Uh, locker rooms are in the back half of the lower floor and staff areas and employee areas are in the front. Uh, given the slope of the site, what this allows us to do is put two thirds of the building from here all the way around to here, essentially below grade. So what that means is that this elevation, the rear elevation looking at the golf course, and half of this elevation is a one-story building as opposed to a full two-story. Uh, the front is a two-story because it's essentially a walkout condition. I'm going to go to the other floor. Mm -hmm. As Jack mentioned, uh, the main parking area is up here at the upper level. And like the existing clubhouse, we're recreating uh, an entrance here off the upper parking area for members. Again, you can see where the elevator is located in a central location there. The whole rear of the club is dining facilities and an outdoor areas area here, which now is oriented along a view down uh, the night fairway. Um, the kitchen is here, there's some event dining here, and a secondary entrance exit here, which leads to the first key box. This is the proposed front elevation. Uh, essentially, we're looking at the lower floor here, which is a, a tongue and groove and a board and batten um, or shiplap uh, siding and shingles above. Uh, this little red box here is a change that we made from the last design, which closes in uh, a covered porch in this location, and that's there to help mitigate any sound that would be transmitted through what was an open wall to the to growth street. The overall average elevation or height of the building here is 32 and a half feet and that's halfway up to this line, which is the fifth roof at the front elevation. <laughs> this is the rear elevation facing the golf course and pulled off the lower terrace area here. And it, it actually is located there just for clarity purposes. But essentially the whole rear of the club is doors and windows you know, at the golf course. It's a single uh, a gable end roof uh, with gables here and here facing the parking lot and some uh, decorative doors on top. This is the west elevation or the elevation looking from the upper parking lot with the main entrance here. There is handicapped uh, accessibility here. You can see a partially covered rear terrace at the rear of the building. And this is a covered porch here, primarily a designated for uh, a pool lunch dining. So during the day when folks are there at the pool, they would come over to the club and have lunch in this area here. The, the site slopes down. This is essentially the slope of the driveway coming up from the lower entrance. Below. And finally, the Grove Street elevation. Uh, you can see the grades do drop quite a bit. This allows us for that walkout condition. Here we have a secondary entrance from, uh, from and to the first key. Again, the side view of the covered terrace area and the lower entrance circle is down at this elevation here. Okay. Do you have a, a render? Yep. 
Here's a proposed view of the, uh, the new club from Grove Street. You can see the, the new entrance drop-off area here, uh, the banding of the lower level, which is a, a kind of a lightish brown kind of natural wood look with uh, cream shingles above, uh, architectural shingle roof, a hip roof here, and the gable end there and at the entrance. This shows the secondary exit entrance to the lower level and the stairway up to the first tee and the rear dining room terrace. Okay. That's our presentation, Mr. Chairman. We're happy to take any questions that uh, the board may have. Questions from the board? <coughs> I'm curious, The uh, it looks like a three and a half story building to the roof peak. And I was curious as to what the, the, the uh, space is above the second floor, the attic space, if you will. It's primarily mechanical space. There's makeup air units for the kitchen, uh, exhaust, uh, ductwork, and ventilation equipment. Okay, so that there's no uh, there's no no plan space. no habitable space. Okay. The average elevation of the club, the, the proposed club, is 25 feet. Okay. okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that one. Okay, a um, couple of things I noticed. Can, can we start with the um, special permit sure. issue? Um, I guess, so um, the opinion of town council was that, uh, as I read it, is that if um, if the uh, conditions that, I uh, shouldn't use that word, um, if the way that the applicant's attorney described the use of accurate, then it's in his opinion that it wouldn't require a special permit, right? And so that opinion all hinges on those couple of statements um, uh, that the applicant's attorney made about the character of how this would be used. Um, that way too. Okay. <laughs> well, and so and so I I, I guess um, and then uh, if we got this other letter saying, yeah, we'll give you these answers, but we're not going to be held to these these answers that um, that we've given you. Um, so I, I just. I don't know if I want to start out with this, but I do think we need to get to the bottom of whether this requires a special permit um, because whether this is an expansion of the use, the way that I look at it, um, it has the potential to be an expansion of the, of the permitted use. Um, and there's a couple of different reasons why, but I want to monopolize the floor. No, I think the three of us are already on that page. So I don't know if you have a letter that was written by um, Mr. Heath. Mm -hmm. I think that's the basis for this. But I guess if you want to simplify that, if it continues to operate the way it operates now, then there's no change. And so there's no special permit. Agreed. And this letter seems to indicate that if you go to page two, where it outlines the use, not the letter to Glenn Redmond, although that letter has an error in it as well. It says that um, your operations will cease at 12 p.m. And if that's what you're willing to be held to, 12 p.m. Yeah. Just saying, that should say 12 a.m. 12 a.m. 12 a.m. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, customer's right. So. Um, okay, so. Uh, it's question three, right? There's some occupancy stated just a little bit lower than that. Anyway. 
right there. So for these two rooms, these numbers don't match the plans. But this only lists two rooms. And the plans show one, two, three, four, five, five potential dining areas, not including the covered porch, which swimming people might have lunch at. So instead of 140, just just calculating the numbers the way they're based on the plans, you'd have 151. And then if you factor in the patio, the golf dining room, the 19th hole, that's 324. And 24 more for the porch. So we need to resolve these numbers somehow. I think the architect can address the occupancy load of the building. Um, I want to point out that the, the case that's relied on is uh, Cumberland Farm v. Wealthy. That was a land court case that actually got appealed to the appeals court that was upheld. And in that case, uh, basically what happened in that case, the, the size of the facility was a liquor store and a convenience store that was grandfathered in, in Wealthy. It was an antiquated building. And they decided that they wanted to raise that building. The court found it was a legal non-conforming use, just like Meadowbrook. And the issue was building a new building. That building almost doubled in size compared to the fire building. And the court found in that that it was not relevant. It was still not an extension, uh, a substantial extension. Of non I, I would agree that that's, a, that's similar here if, you're, if it's all about membership in, in the golf use. But you have a, a, an ancillary use here, which is special events. Um, and the, the, um, the, the added space in the, the way that it's calculated here going from 150 to 324, the added space um, that you could have to have those special events, I would say, is not the same. It doesn't fall under that same realm of just increasing the inventory because you can essentially change the the use for that fun that part of the function. Are you of the talking about the aspect of the outside also, the deck? Well, well, yeah, because you can seat people there. You can use that as part of your function. I would say that's a great part of that's a great part. So what, so. We, what we've done with that, and it, it's actually referenced in the draft decision, is limited the use of that rear deck. Um, it was originally proposed uh, that it was going to be able to occupy 60 people. And now as part of the proposed uh, decision, which you know, would be a condition, is that it would be limited to five, five tables, just sofas, and it will be limited to time use also. It will be part of your site plan approval condition that we represented and we're, we're absolutely willing to live with. So there's, a, there's, there's clearly uh, not an intent, and we don't think an ability, to expand what's, what's going on there. Um, you know, we've, we've listed the capacities and the seating in the main areas. Um, you know, I think those speak for themselves. The size of the building is, is, is actually smaller than what's there today. It's about 700 square feet smaller. No, that's fine. But if, if you look at the second floor plan, right, the upstairs plan. So I think that the case you stated as, uh, as whatever uh, would apply if this was the dining room, the terrace, and then all lockers, right? Because you're expanding the use for the clubs, but it doesn't really expand the membership. But that second floor has something called the golf dining room, something called the 19th hole, something called uh, the grill, right? So those are three specifically targeted dining areas. For members. For members. And, and, and just okay. In, in the uh, membership, yeah, if, right. I, as a, if I can say the membership, we explain the membership capacity of Meadowbrook in any private golf course is driven by the golf. So, the course can only accommodate so many members. So, so, so is there a restriction for from doing special events that you're only going to use two of those rooms, or it's let me uh, could, right. That's that's really okay. to me. That's the difference. I get the goal for members piece. Could I take a moment and just give sure. you the use case piece? This let's forget the outside area for just a moment. The inside area today. That's basically what exists today in our clubhouse. We have a function room, a dining room, a 19 hole that exists today, just like up here. So the number of seats that we could house in our current building is the same as this building here, inside. Because if you look at the square footage, you can only get so many seats in there. 
the square footage inside is actually smaller than our current inside internal square footage. So we can sit the same number of people. So that's point one. Outside area is slightly larger. The reason why it's larger is we think that that's an attractive part of the club, and we want some of our members to be outside after a round of golf or a round. Of, and we have purposefully built that to be more of a casual environment. A few tables, sofas, rocking chairs, a casual piece. The challenge that we have when we're a nine volt court, and this is why we can say with confidence we will be operating similarly. In order to house golfers on the golf course on a Saturday or Sunday morning, it occupies a significant amount of the parking space. You can't have functions operating on a Saturday and Sunday, which was when you would have most functions happening. During the afternoon, the afternoon tee times come in, the pool and tennis become active, and they occupy a significant amount of clubhouse parking area. So we are not in a position in our season, and we said this up front, that we have an on-season, a uh, prime season and an off-season. We're not going to change what we do in the off-season. We're not going to be having different events or more events, etc. And during our season, we cannot physically have large functions of 300 people that show up at our clubhouse. It, just can't, it can't physically happen for people to enjoy the rest of the club. It's impossible to have that. We have, on average, just to give you an idea of our private functions, are primarily membership driven. They are the club, there'll be a comedy night, etc. They host somewhere between 80 and 110 people for events like that. On average, every year for the past, I'm going to guess, seven years or so, I'm here, the general manager of our club, Bob Morelli, we have somewhere between 18 and 25 private functions. 80% of those private functions today, I hate to say it, are bereavements, um, bridal showers, wedding showers, etc. That's our sweet spot. We did not design this course for private functions. We were told early on with working with Weaver and Associates and our builder stateside, if, and by the way, we went to at least eight different golf clubs in this area. And we asked them, who had just went through renovations, what should you think about for functions? They said, if you design a building on functions, you're making a mistake. And so in the back of our head as we designed this, it was not to expand private functions because you do not make money. So our use, as I said at the beginning, remains the same. The space that's outlined here is the same space that would exist today. And we'll be happy to show you the existing layout with the dining room, the function room, and the 19th grill, just like this and the number of seats that that could house is basically the same. So I, I, I hope that that helps a little bit in terms of both the use case and the ability to expand beyond its current use of our clubhouse today. We, we have said this clearly, we're gonna to continue to operate the way we operate today. We have, we, we, that's all we can do. Which one's considered the event room? The grill room? The room on the right? So, so the event room? So mm -hmm. just, mm -hmm. if you don't mind, I'll just yeah. point, yeah. and this will maybe help a little bit. We, we designed this building to be modular. And in between these rooms are the ability to open and close rooms to be able to handle different things. So think about this as a bar area, sitting area, you know, you want to get a drink or a quick bite, et cetera, a small area here. This is the function room, about 60 people. That holds the majority of our sweet spot, the bridal showers, the bereavement, et cetera. When we have a comedy night for our membership, we have somewhere between 100 to 110 folks who will join something like that. We can open up this wall, and now we can have the stage or you know the front of the room and the rest of the area open for members to be able to participate in this. Between these two rooms, it's about 100 people or so, 110 people sitting in these areas. That allowed us to say, you could have that function going on, a few people could be over here, no one would be using this room because you wouldn't be able to fit anybody in the parking lot up in the back. And these would be evening events. And as I mentioned, we do about 18 to 30 of these, and 80% and of these are, as I mentioned, earlier. does that help a little bit? And, and if you looked at our current facility, um, there's a fireplace in the middle. It divides a function room and a dining room. That basically is this. And it sits the same number of people that it sits today. This square footage, I'll remind, is 700 square feet less than our current inside square footage on this floor. And the whole building, sorry, versus second floor. 
Um, I guess, how do I put this? Um, I completely understand where you um, in your club right now thinks that you'll use this facility. Mm -hmm. It's a way that it's designed to use the, what we need to, to, to help the community and the impacts from what you're doing or, or may do in the future, right? You may hit on hard times and um, or the, the, the way that functions work may be different in the future and and so you, um, you, you right now that what you're saying is your facility is capped by parking yet we don't there's no parking information in this application at all so we're taking that on on your word so there's something got to be some constraint in here that needs some there needs to be some constraint that says <coughs> yes this is the building this is how we're going to use it this is how we're going to use it forever until we come back and ask for some other type of use. I, I guess the, the, the porch is a good example. The outdoor space, I, a number of us were on the board when that porch got added. And I, I, I think we all get it. I mean, you want to be outside. You don't want to be um, um, But now that's an existing condition. And so there's a creep. I, I, not a bad creep, I think, but a creep of, okay, I know at the time there was this discussion of, well, we're not increasing the capacity of the club, we're not increasing the capacity, the seating capacity, because these people will be seated outside instead of being in, in indoors at the time. Um, and that's likely that's, that will happen here, and if we, but what, what you're saying now is that you'll put restrictions in here to confirm that that's the case. And I think, at least from my standpoint, that's what we need to make sure that, that okay, if it's not a special permit, we need to make sure that it's not an expansion of the use in the, um, uh, in the special functions area. Not the membership, I guess. John, in the board, would it be helpful just to give you probably an internal view of our current dining function area? Because I think that would at least help in the comparison so that you would see the availability to have 300 people or whatever the number is, mm -hmm. is available today in our building. But we haven't done that ever. Mm -hmm. Ever. And so we're designing this building not for a function. Golf courses are challenged right now who have built dining event functions and they are not being consumed and used. And seven of the eight courses that I went to personally, that was the main word from that. Don't overbuild that function. We're not going to make money on private functions as a club. We are a golf club with pool and tennis. We have a membership that has been pretty steady for the last 15 years, I don't see how that could change. It, 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 I'm with you on it. Because because we, can't, we can't have more people at the pool. Yeah. Our pool right. is, is limited in capacity, and the golf course is limited in capacity. It's not like an 18 hole course where everyone can go up the first hole and just keep playing. Anybody who wants to play has to clock that first hole multiple times. So if you know the club yeah. or play a nine hole course, you can understand that becomes a natural capacity piece on the, on the club and how it opens. There's no plans to make it just an 18 hole golf course. Many, many years ago that was brought up that we can't we can't do it. So that will never happen. Yeah, it, it just you know so I think um, what Kevin's saying, right, we can show you that plan. And perhaps we can work with the planning department and maybe tighten some language up a little bit to get to that. But you know, I guess the lawyer in me comes out a little bit and I just I just mm -hmm. want to point out in that Cumberland Bomb case because I talked a little bit, there is a little bit of a equivalent because it was questioned about the increase in size, and, and this is reading from the decision that the court said increase in size from 1,700 square feet to 2,700 square feet is relatively minor. I mean, that's what the court be born if it was only a 1,700 square foot building. And simply improves the interior layout and allows it to stock more inventory. And then it says an increase in inventory or sales volume does not change the quality or character of the use. 
So, you know, even if there is an increase, it still doesn't change the, the character of the use driving it to the necessity of a special permit, which we don't think they will be. I just don't, we'll I just don't think they're equivalent uses, though. Yeah, they are but it's a, it's a, it's a, if it, you were building a, indicative. Yeah, the building's old, right? So it's, it's definitely got, so probably, it's the kitchen's is. probably way too small and probably unsafe. The locker rooms probably aren't comfortable enough. But, so if you were expanding that and gaining square footage because you're making, you know, more comfortable locker rooms and a bigger, safer kitchen, you can see where that, um, increase in building size doesn't really add anything to the number of people that are using the facility. Well, that might change the quality of the food and the ability to serve it, but I don't know if it's sure, going to change the number so of people. Sure, but so you can increase the dues on the members, big deal. Uh, but I think it really increase membership, but but the concern here is the non-membership potential of the building because it's so large, so it definitely needs to be better explained than how it's outlined in this letter, because all we had to go on with numbers is what's on the architectural plans, and they show a significantly different number. So I think we could probably write something into the decision that caps that number, or you know, the fire department could actually say your your capacity is limited at 160 or something like that. So you'd have to figure out what that number is. I don't want to, you know, cut you off at the heels here. I'm gonna make sure the number works for you, but I don't want it to be 324. Either. We will make sure that you have what's available today, what it will be in tomorrow, because I think that comparison will be important. One very similar to what we're doing on the drainage piece. What we got for water, we'll do it uh, today and tomorrow. We'll do something similar as well and make sure that we get that type of Yeah, so I have, I have two comments. I think if you do do that and create a chart similar to this, I think it should include everything, including the porches, which I am skeptical that that isn't an increase if you include it. And to consider that and also to make it super clear what's membership only and what's private use available. And I think also to connect that to whatever the fire department capacity or other kind of external to us need to look at. But then I think including the porch, I think Nick makes a really good point that that is more space and it is potentially some more expansion. You could have people hanging out for longer, period, which may change your use of the parking. And so I would include that because I'm skeptical that this existing parking is actually going to handle, even if this stays, and I see where you're going with this, I just think that, th that trusting that your parking use isn't going to be affected by this is uh, short sighted. So spelling it out may be more helpful for us to think that through. In, in a, a little bit better detail. Okay. We'll help you with that information. Okay. Other questions or comments from the board? Related to special permit issues? I mean, I think the yeah, special the permit issue there. also very specifically has the numbers quoted on the private function space, which the decrease of the clubhouse goes from 152 to 140, which at this point is inaccurate. I mean, we need to understand, like, could you actually have members there at the same time as a private event? If it's, it's, it's still very fuzzy. And I think making sure that this remains accurate and so the special permit is, uh, waiver is valid means that that needs to be super clear as well. And to answer your question, there are times when there are members up there and there's a private function. Those pri that happens Yeah, I mean, if today. you've got something starting at 3 and somebody's tea time is at 2.30, they're still going to be and there. As I mentioned, 80% yeah. of our private functions are 60 to 80 in terms of bridal wedding bereavement things. Okay. Safe plan still on that? Okay. No. That's um, fine. Yeah. Uh, I guess I, I just have two questions that really um, uh, for Jack. It, it's related to the um, to the circle um, or turnaround. Um, I'm concerned about the turning radius of trucks um, getting into the circle. I'm assuming it would be at circulation would be counterclockwise, counter 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 um, and so coming in and then being able to take that. Um, that hard right and still being able, uh, you know, getting around the circle. I assume that deliveries um, are often enough with a semi um, that that would need to be accommodated. Is that, is that, 
to get you. Well, if you want to, well, Bob Morelli's our general manager, because if you want to get some input on our delivery schedule and the types of vehicles that come in, or are you just more specific on the turnaround? I'm just, I just, yeah. We'll, the we'll the plan is on the turnaround. Um, most of our deliveries are not huge trucks. They're smaller trucks to accommodate what we do. We envision them pulling off to the side on the right-hand side as they come in. They may not have to take the entire piece. If they're, if they're too big, they could back out and go out the driveway. So they don't have to make the complete radius mm -hmm. through there. If it's a larger vehicle, usually those things happen in the non-peak times, meaning when there aren't a lot of people there. We envision them coming up the driveway, backing down in, so they deliver and, and dispose, and then pull right back out. They wouldn't make the full turn around the road. At least that's our envision, how we envision the right. Um, and then you probably need to have um, a curb ramp somewhere on this circle. I don't see that, but um, I can add that. We probably have that for the hand for the towards the entrance. Yeah, yeah. For, right there. Yes. Right. Yeah. I'll, I'll, add, curb. I'll add a detail on that. Well, even for the loader, even for the person making deliveries of the hand truck. Yeah. <clears throat> One thing that I thought was pretty funny, I, I went out to the site on Sunday and rode through there. And uh, you, know, you would think that with an application coming before the board, it would tell people not to park in front. Nose first, <laughs> arrogant, little Volkswagen convertible, old bug, nice car. Don't care, it's, I can park right here. Escalade next to them and then up and down the street, all the other golfers that are just you know, too lazy to park in the empty lot. So the whole back end of the lot was empty. But these people had a park in front. The red Corvette, which is outside, was actually parked with a circle. Was, uh, was so that person can walk a few feet, I guess. I don't understand that. So we're going to do something across this edge here to prevent that from happening if this is going to go forward. I think you're going to have to do something to prevent parking there. Yeah. Parking nose first where oh, your sign is now, basically. You know, I mean, that's just silly. Um, yeah, that's loaded. But Sunday there were two cars in front and then at least uh, two, four, you know, as you make your way down towards past the uh, past where the carts come down. They've got parallel parking along. Yeah, the where it says no parking and, and all that stuff. So how do we prevent that? How do we stop that? Do we put bollards up? Do we put a front and curb up? Because I don't think you're supposed to be parking there. Um, See, is that is that... Uh, you can't enforce the parking rules, but we're supposed to believe that you'll enforce the, the occupancy rules. That's what's concerning me. But is that, what are the parking rules that are for there? They're actually further down Grove Street. That's also a challenge too, right? Pass, you, know, profit. you pass that first kind of uh, woodsy pull off, you know, where you start getting towards compost and where people go. Yes. That's a whole different challenge and that's not your problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I would say that the first, you know, from this curb cut, to probably the, I'm trying to think of where they were. Must have been up to the, um, the pro shop. No, no it's no. Cars come down before that. It's just in front of where the clubhouse is. There yeah, are probably four or five cars that park parallel on the rear. No, the that's the car. <laughs> yeah, so is this, I mean, so. That car parks in front all the time. This is Google Maps with the car driving. This is the on the street version. Okay. So there's, you know, it looks as if these are legal so parking. Yeah, no problem. I'll, I'll, I'll come up. Yeah, these are, are these legal parking spots by the wall here or not? And if they're not, I think what yeah. Nick is saying, then we need to figure out some type of method Correct. to stop that okay. and make it clear that that is not parking. Okay. Yeah, because they're blocking the sight line from the entrance. Primarily, that's the concern. And then they're okay. backing out. That's the concern that came to? The well, that's the concern that I see. Okay. I mean, I was on a, a, a bike, so, you know, I was careful to come back out. Okay. But you have to make sure that you're not. Coming to okay. our car. Those cars are backing up, okay. and so there's pedestrians and other cars coming up on a, you know, on a corner. We talked about the sight line before, and, and um, when you had the entrance into the service, we had a service entrance on this side before, remember? You had a second curb cut. Oh, in the previous? Really early, yeah, yeah. and we were talking, we were concerned that that was Correct. too close to the corner and blocking sight lines. So that, I don't think that's safe yeah. now. If there's room, and if the town is for, say, parallel parking, potentially, you could think about that, but okay. I don't know what that does to the, uh, 
aesthetic of the club, frankly. This is a pretty nice building, I think. And I think it's well done and good scale to it. And just parking like that just really cheapens it. Okay. So what are, do you know what the rules are for parking along this street? I'm sorry, I don't. Okay. We'd be happy to work with you to figure that yeah. out. So let's figure out that. Okay. And at the very least, probably put a curb probably to where that escalator is. Is that an escalator or a Jeep? The last white car. I think if we, had, you know, if we ran a curbing there, then there wouldn't be any parking, and that's part of it. And that would free up the turn. Because again, you're saying you have capacity for parking. On Sunday, there was a load of parking around back. Yeah. And there was nobody at the pool, I don't think. It was kind of early. I, I would say, Mr. Chairman, um, probably multiple, multiple years of history of that's just the way it's been. It Everything looks like it's parking. I, mean, I think I, if I, I was a new member, I wouldn't necessarily know because I particularly it's, it's paved. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, it, I think it, in, a, in the same way, it also, if it's not clearly marked, then you go up the road a little bit where there's kind of patchy grass. And when you do get to the capacity of the swim meet days or something like that, then that's going to just, you know, uh, spill over easily. Okay. Yeah, we, so we should work on that part of it. Okay. Um, yep. And I still don't know how many parking spaces you have, actually. Jack, do you know how many yeah. parking spaces there are? So 138. Yeah, 138. 138. And that includes for staff, then? Yes. So it's remaining the same. And it's not including the spaces you see in the gravel area on the right. Those are not counted. And is it? Sorry, that's actually in excess of what's calculated under parking file. Okay. Okay. Um, and just trash one more time. Could you tell me what you're doing with the trash? You're going to wheel it out to... Uh, we, we, currently, the trash compactor is in the front of the building. Right. Um, we're going to take that whole piece and move it to the back of the building so that the pickups of that will all be happening in the back by the maintenance facility. So that should eliminate some... By the, the maintenance shop. By the maintenance building? By the maintenance facility back. In. So, yeah, if you go through the parking lot down to the right-hand side, you can probably house it down that area. Okay, so you're going you're gonna to move that... So what that means is we will, we, our staff, will end up moving our trash physically to the back of that building, which okay. isn't the ideal thing, but we think it was a good decision to make. So do you have at least provisions for temporary holding inside the building somewhere? I mean, you know, in the winter, are you going to bring individual bags down every five Well, in the winter, we won't have much yeah, going true. on. So, so it's usually during decent weather to yeah. get back there. And we do, on the first floor, there is office and storage, et cetera, which I'm sure we'll be able to provide something. On that side of the building? Uh, uh, yeah, if you, if you were coming up the driveway, yeah, south side right. OK. Thank you. If I may, Mr. Chairman, a lot of those changes we're discussing were pursuant to discussions with the neighbors on concerns that they had from the prior plan. Okay. So th those are like the trash locations from where it was before. I'm just yeah, that was the other place. They were parking. There's, uh, yeah, so there's parking further down, sort of nose in on the grass. Andrew, if you just this page on the architectural, I just think. What page was it? No, not architectural. Sorry, the site plans. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know this number. It's way down that way. Probably sheet two. Three. With the new building, so yeah. So I think that the curb bed, if you if you get, scroll up a little bit, sorry, Probably down. <laughs> so there's a um, golf cart passageway down at the bottom. So we're not the right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then you can see the gray line that actually indicates where there should be a curb. There's parking right where your cursor is right now. People are parking there as well. And on the opposite side. Yeah. So I think I think when we write this in, I think it has to go all the way from one. Well, but I don't know if we can. Well, see, it, just we some type of there, but we might have to just figure out what the rules are for parking on right. the street. If right. the town allows parking there, then great. Right. But if they don't, then that has to be remedied somehow. Yes. 
I think public safety said they've never had a call issue or complaint with the parking on the street. I understand that, but that doesn't mean that it should be allowed. Right. It's not allowed. Right. Okay. Now, um, I really don't like the cars backing up like that. That's the thing, right? It's just not a safe move. It's a narrow street, so it's probably icy in the winter. You know, look again, you people aren't parking there. Look there. Somebody. Um, no, but compost day, you've got traffic. Compost day, there's a lot of traffic, a lot of dog walkers. So we just need to look a little bit further back and see what, what what's allowed, what's safe. The only other question I had was on lighting. I know you did a sort of photometric, photometric plan. Um, lesson learned from the library, the bollards you're going to use, even though the foot candles sort of come down, you know, real tight to that bollard. It's glass all around, and so that glare comes straight up. So if that's available with a shield on the on the street side, if you will, because you've got some bollards along the walkway, right? So if you can shield the, um, the street side, then you're lighting the walkway, and the neighbors across the street aren't getting a blast of light from that fixture. Yeah, actually, yeah, all the lights are dark sky. <coughs> yeah, I know, but that's uh, for the birds. <laughs> We're no, talking no, about the, the neighbors. The light source is, is up high in the fixture, and the, yeah. there are cans that extend down. I know, but it... So it, it keeps the spread of the light. Right. And view of the light source. Yeah, we had the same issue yeah. with the library. Yeah. Those are probably brighter, but... If there's a clear lens, the light still goes horizontal. I understand that it's sort of somewhat contained. That's why you don't get that big foot candle spread, but you're still getting this horizontal vector off that light. So I would- I can show you cuts of the pictures. Yeah, no, I have, I have them. I have them, they're nice. You know? Everything's nice, everything's really nice. I'm just telling you that you might get complaints about the lights if they're, if they're clear glass on the street side. So I would look at shielding those. Yeah, we had to come up with an elaborate thing for the library to fix that. I think we talked about that at one of the DRT meetings. Gene uh, okay. brought it up at the last DRT meeting and brought the library up as an example. Yeah. Very That's all. It's just so you won't get complaints. That's, that's all I had. Yes. I don't think they're. I don't think they're that big of an issue. I think they can all be resolved. I uh, do like the building. I think it's, it's going to look nice. Thanks. I think it's well oriented and very well scaled. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, questions? Uh, Jack, you said that this would be propane for the time being? For the time being. They use propane now. Was the uh, location of the propane tanks on the plants? I couldn't find them. Yes. Um, if you go to the propane plant, trying to work with the gas company, but they just haven't received much traction with them. So, so is that underground? Is that underground. It's underground. It's underground. Yeah. It's underground. It would not be a good amenity above ground. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, any, anything else? No. We'll take some questions from the public. Uh, please make sure you state your name and your address and make sure that you've signed in so we can spell your name correctly. Yes, sir. Paul Graz, what's 293 Grove Street? I live directly across from the uh, existing building. That's my driveway for Bob uh, I don't reside there. I own a house. Um, I do uh, appreciate some of the changes, keeping the driveway the same. That helps with the, with the glare. And getting rid of the uh, dumpsters was, uh, was a big help, too. But I didn't see any proposed plantings on this. Right now, if you went there with that Google Street View, there's a 36 to 48 inch tree, giant deciduous tree that provides a lot of shielding of the clubhouse. 
I don't see anything. I don't even see any room on this plan to do any plan things other than out in the right away. Which, um, so I, I strongly urge the commission to require some good plantings for screenings. And I don't mean inch and a half calipers. They're going to take another 50 years to grow. Something of substance to provide shielding to Grove Street and the abutters, and it will help the noise. It will help the light, it will help the noise, and just general visual appearance. Um, other than that, uh, you know, it, it, I want to see plan things done, and I just, with that turnaround there, and the uh, infiltration system there, I don't see where there's room to plant anything on the actual site. Do you want so, to go to the site, the landscape one? Um, I don't know if they can be made to place it in the right of way, but there needs to be some screening put up. You know, this house is right across the road, and, um, you know, little shrubs in front of the building aren't going to do, aren't going to do much. <coughs> the, uh, for the residential properties, especially once that tree's gone. That's it. Thank you. Just looking at the site plan. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, uh, for the record, Attorney uh, Stephen uh, Ciccatelli, representing Nicholas Bonanno uh, and Mr. Paul Prince, also, uh, who reside uh, at 283 and 293 Grove Street, respectively. They're the principal butters across the street. Um, I, I'm glad that the um, commission raised the issue of the, of the special permit. We have requested uh, the town council's opinion letter regarding whether this was an expansion or alteration of a pre-existing non-conforming use, and we were advised uh, that that was uh, that was a privilege. We didn't quite understand that, but it, it's being discussed um, in the packet that I just gave you. Is a petition signed by my two clients and many of the residents of Grove Street opposing to the petition as presented. Uh, and I have to stress this point. Uh, my, my clients are not opposed to a new clubhouse per se. They're opposed to what's presented this, this evening. Um, and one of the main issues, and, and Attorney McGrail, I have a great deal of respect for, he and his client did reach out, did meet with us. Uh, a lot of the conditions that are being offered up um, by the applicant uh, this evening, um, we, d we did raise concerns regarding those issues, and they are conditions, but I uh, respectfully suggest they are not conditions that this commission would not have required any anyway uh, under your site plan criteria, which specifically talks about maximizing pedestrian, bicycle, vehicular access and safety, uh, minimizing visual intrusion to abutting residential properties and public ways, minimizing environmental impacts to adjacent properties, and minimizing impacts to abutting residential development. Um, on the special permit issue, and I've given you a copy of a prior uh, application filed by Attorney Latham years ago, there was a determination made in the past that this could be an expansion or alteration uh, of the pre-existing non-conforming use. Uh, I have read the Cumberland Farms case, and I agree with Attorney McGrail. If you take a retail space and you maintain the same use, and you simply maybe increase the size of the building, I don't know that that's determinative, but what we've heard over and over again uh, from the applicant, and, and I think in Attorney McGreal's letter to the Commission and Town Council, he stressed that membership will not be increased. Um, I don't think that's the issue here. It's the type of use, the quality of the use, not just the size of the building. Um, we're, we're looking at a, a multi-million dollar project, clearly, um, I believe there's going to be some financing involved, and that, of course, is not uh, any of our business, but I, I would think a commercial lender in determining that debt service can be carried on a multi-million dollar loan would want to see an increase in revenue. And I would respectfully submit that that increase in revenue is going to come from functions. It's going to come from increased 
uh, capacity, seating capacity inside as well as outside. Uh, it's going to involve increased uh, food sales and alcohol sales. Uh, if you're not increasing membership, I don't see where else it can come from. So obviously to afford the construction of the constructive loan, construction loan, there's going to be an increase in the quality and the nature of the use and the intensity of the use. And, and I think that might very well trigger a special permit review. Uh, in, in, in terms of the outdoor seating, that's one of the main concerns that my, my two clients have. And, and the issue basically is this, the one thing that my clients did ask for, which was met with the very adamant no, was a relocation of the building. Uh, simply putting the building in its present location, maybe set back slightly, 30 feet is approximately the width of this room from the street layout, and then having a 25-foot building, uh, t t turning it slightly but creating all the open space, there is going to be a noise issue. So what my clients are suggesting is that the building be pushed back into the parking area, which is already developed, it's already impervious. That would allow for increased um, a screening that would protect my client's property. It would have the outdoor area facing the golf course, not any of the residential abutters. Um, the, the curbing we do feel is important. Uh, I do not believe that the parking requirements under the Reading Bylaw allows for perpendicular parking such that you could basically back out into a public way. Uh, you could potentially do that in a parking lot and there are still requirements as to the width of the aisle, but certainly not in a public way. It's very, it's very dangerous. So, so basically, the conditions that we're concerned with is the, the relocation of the building to deal with the issues of noise. This uh, commission have requested a traffic study. I think in looking at a traffic study, the issues of parking can be looked at, the issues of traffic can be looked at. Again, the use is not going to remain the same. If it was, I don't believe the application would be before you. It's a complicated traffic study because, and it's a par complicated parking study because of the various uses. Golf, in which a car might sit there for a prolonged period of time, a restaurant use could be one, two hours, the pool use. So I think the board should re request and require a traffic study to determine if there's adequate parking on site for presently and for the proposed use. Uh, and I think someone should look at, at Grove Street as to potentially where this parking should be redesigned, whether no parking signs should be erected. Uh, clearly what's happening right now is the perpendicular parking that you see uh, is in the roadway layout. It's on town property. It's being used uh, for a private purpose. Again, it's not appropriate. I think there is there is a safety um, issue. So, so again, the, the main concern, and also in the packet, I've given you copies of um, the petition that my client submitted to the board a short while ago, copy of the petition that was previously submitted in 2017 showing the design of many other golf courses. And yes, if you have a pre-existing building and that building is being modified and it's too close to a right of way, uh, I think one can understand that. But when you're raising a building and you're starting from scratch, if you look at all these other various courses, typically golf course design would dictate that you push the building back allow for screening. Uh, again, having the deliveries in front, having the turnaround in front, literally 30 feet from the street, there's a further noise impact from that. Uh, if you look at some of the photographs, there's an interesting photograph uh, of some of the traffic. One shows a, a car and a delivery truck sort of playing a game of, of, of chicken. And, and again, this is a, this is a concern uh, because of the uh, existing uh, traffic on, on Grove Street. So, so the, the, the real issue, I think, is is this an expansion or alteration of uh, the pre-existing non-conforming use that would require Section 6 finding? And again, the finding, as you know, is whether the proposed alteration would be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing non-conformity. And that's really the question. And I think we, we still have questions regarding seating, regarding traffic, regarding parking. Uh, but to say that the use is going to remain exactly the same, I don't think it justifies the expenditure for this type of a building. Also, it is my understanding that there will be some AU1P plans filed to cordon off and develop other land, which certainly uh, the club has the right to do. Uh, but that would basically involve the construction of new homes, and I think the applicant should perhaps 
present that to the board as to what the plans are because you're looking at, at a site as it stands right now if 81 PRA and our plans are signed and different lots are created, you're now going to have uh, other houses that might be, that might be affected uh, by the uh, operation of the club. So I think all that should probably be disclosed. Um, and that's basically my client's uh, position. So again, what we have requested that has not been uh, considered seriously, in, in my opinion, with all due respect, is the relocation of the building towards the rear of the site. We feel that that would solve a variety of the problems related to noise, uh, screening, etc. Thank you very much. What's your current membership? Uh, membership families is about 360 to 375. It just it fluctuates. As, like, membership families are in that category, and then people have membership categories that they're in. We'll call what they call tennis people. Um, I, just, I guess I just find it interesting that this letter that you included here, that Mr. Sicatel included, which I think was something that happened in 1995, mm -hmm. but sort of using it as a basis, but it, it indicates that club membership is plus or minus 400, so that was uh, 23 years ago. The membership hasn't really increased. I don't know that that supports your case. Um, again, I mean, town council is telling us that the way the letter was presented, that it met the criteria for not being a special permit. We just have some questions about how all of that is worded, and we think we're going to work through that. So we'll have to see what town council comes back with when we present it that way. And then we need a lot of information here I'd like to get through at some point. I don't know, it's not that I want to weigh in on it all right now. Does anybody else have any comments on this? I'd like to see if there are any accidents on Grove Street that might be caused by traffic problems. Yeah, we could ask the police, but... Um, we had a DRT and the police okay. were there. Yeah. And I don't think they yeah, had any issues. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, oftentimes they don't have very specific data like that. They can say it's on Grove Street. So when we're doing that Franklin Street development, it's the same thing, right? There's. The accident could be anywhere along that length, and it's hard to say that it's happening in a particular location. Um, do we have a diagram that shows the uh, the legal right of way of Grove Street? Because the corner, I mean, part of the problem with the parking and, and so forth is this uh, did this corner, which is like three times as wide as the rest of the street. Well, I think it's del it's delineated on here, right, uh, on the survey. Yes. Well, is is that the t the town right of way? That is the town right of way. Okay. From this curve to this tangent, can you pan? Yep. To the this point, and then it it takes a turn here. On the other side, it's a curve. Hmm. So this bold line is the right of way, right of way line right here. So if there were sidewalks, that's where they would be? The back of the sidewalk. Yeah, the, the back of sidewalk. You typically in running the back of sidewalks in the property line. Yeah. The, the edge of the line. Hmm. It's too bad. <laughs> we created the, the corner problem ourselves. <laughs> well, who knows? We're going to have that came up. I, um, I had one question on noise. You mentioned um, somewhere I saw this. I'm not seeing it in the hard copy, but um, the I think it's on. The, I don't know what side you call this. Um, towards the <coughs> parking lot, I guess. Um, there's the. Side, uh, side of the porch um, and there was a note on the electronic plans if you have them. It's on the architectural plan. The sound screen? Yeah. So I, I guess I want to know have more detail on what that sound screen is because 
Um, yeah. If you go to the uh, front elevation there, uh, that's the rear, so the one before that. Originally, this porch, this porch was open, and there were cable rails that ran across here. It was completely blocked yeah. open. And what we've done is filled up half of that opening with a solid wall at 42 inches and ran the ship lap across that. So that's a 100% sound barrier. And we also then added lattice up above, which is about 60% enclosed. And we are going to add a flexate uh, panels on the inside of that to get any airborne noise stopped from coming out this, this front elevation of that covered porch. So essentially it's about a 95% sound barrier on this side of the porch. So with that change, it'd be interesting to see, you know, what um, the Lexan panels, what you're specifically um, talking about, you know, the, the detail, the yeah, SDC, yeah. That is in the uh, construction drawings, and certainly you can make that a condition as part of the approval process. <laughs> Because I, I do think that the way that the um, building is situated now um, with the deck in the, in the back and the, the building actually acting as a shield that some of the, or, um, all, all of the noise that currently is generated from people sitting on the deck um, will no longer be heard by the, the residents. That's not to say there won't be noise, um, but it would be generated from um, from people using that using that deck. And, and, and just on that because just the, also there is about <coughs> three quarters of that is also has a roof on that as well. So there's a you know, area that um, kind of stays up and mm -hmm. in that area. Yeah, I mean it's about twice as far away now. Right. It was about 40, 45 feet maybe from the street. Now it's at least twice that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're gonna get noise from the club and uh, not mean to sound insensitive to the neighbors, but uh, I can hear I can hear Sturgis Park from my house and I'm, you know, it's well around the corner. So when they're playing soccer, there's a lot of screaming and stuff. And, I think it's great, frankly. But, uh, this is a social club, and there's going to be noise there, and it's been there for a long time, so it's not like it's, it's a new thing. And it's not really. Uh, I could see that if it goes too late, it could be annoying, but I don't know that it's offensive. At least that's my opinion on that part of it. Um, sure, you can hear the pool, and you'll probably hear the pool, and again, that's. I don't know if that's an unhappy sound, necessarily. So, uh, idling trucks, I'd, I'd be concerned about that. Um, so certainly if there's a larger truck, then you know, you should make them shut off their engines if they're in front. They should definitely pull all the way around. Now, um, just trying to understand, so if a truck or if a larger truck were to come in and have to pull up to the, to the west elevation, there's actually an access point now to, to load from there, or does that only lead to the lockers? There's currently an access point? There's currently a wall that runs along the driveway. A the truck along that wall, unload the market, around the building, and the wall around the building. It goes into the kitchen. That's currently how it's done. And the new plan? The new plan doesn't have a loading area on that side? There seems to be a door. Right. Oh, sorry, wrong one. I'm looking at the architectural plans. Well, that's just something you're going to have to manage. I mean, they can't be parked at the entrance to the driveway like that pictures are shown. So we'll have to make sure we write a condition in about something like that. Um, 
I don't want to keep defending this project, by the way, but I like the architecture, and as an architect, when I look at that site plan, the new location and the angle of it reduces the amount of mass that happens from the street to the front of the building significantly. And I think that even with its, even without the scale that that presents, there'll be significantly less, less presence from the street side by this building. That's, that's my professional opinion. Uh, notwithstanding the scale that, that's sort of built into the design. And with the turn, a, a more kind of attractive front than yes. what's there right now with yeah. the trash yeah piece in the back, like what you're looking at to. So, you know, I think it's a, it's adding to some nice character with that entrance being there. So and what I'm getting at with that is that the, the, I guess the criteria is substantially detrimental to the neighborhood. I'm not sure that on massing and on position that it's substantially detrimental to the neighborhood. Now, if we can't resolve this use issue and, and somehow it comes out that, yeah, there's 300 people, 300 person capacity, and they're willing to use it, that would be substantially detrimental. I think that that's where it all lies, right there on that. Mm -hmm. So if we can clear that up and come to an agreement on how that's presented and used, then, then I'd be okay with what mm -hmm. our town council told us about. Uh, thank you. Uh, Nick Bonanno, I live at 283 Grove Street, and as I mentioned last year, uh, I've been a long time member at Metal Brook, 35 years, and been obviously a resident at Grove Street a little bit longer than that. Uh, I also serve on the board of Metal Brook. There's a lot of good things about Metal Brook, and I said that last year, and as a butter, and as my attorney mentioned, I have no issue with the club wanting to build a new clubhouse. It's really the truth. The size of the clubhouse, the capacity of the clubhouse, uh, and the location of the clubhouse. Uh, the average height, I guess, is 25 feet. But there are certainly points that are significantly higher, and I don't know what that is because I couldn't find that on the plans. Uh, but uh, I certainly agree with a lot of points that were raised by the commission and, and my attorney, obviously. But I would like to talk a little bit about that entrance, if I, if I could. Um, I apologize for my back. The proposal that was submitted last year actually introduced a, a vertical granite curve to actually define, better define Grove Street to kind of, you know, mimic the curve on the other side. And uh, the only issue directly opposite uh, my neighbor's house and, and the headlight clear. So uh, certainly sliding the entrance further down that proposed curve would uh, accomplish the same thing in terms of location. This is, I don't know, I've seen so many trucks. I don't know how these trucks are going to get in here and do anything. Uh, there's huge trucks that come down. Every year the trucks get larger. Uh, so even if they pull up, you gotta, even if they pull in and try to back in here, this is like an 8% grade. And then it's going to have this island with a catch basin. It's going to be jammed up. You've got people coming and going at the same time. So something something needs to be done with the entrance uh, to, to make it work for everybody. Uh, and putting that vertical uh, grand curving back to better define the road certainly addresses that hidden parking uh, problem. It, it improves the sight lines of uh, people coming out of the club and people driving south on the road. Uh, and those would be pluses. Uh, eliminating this this here would stop the delivery trucks that are currently uh, using Grove Street as a staging area. They actually park out here. Not all of them go in. They park here and they idle for 15, 20 minutes and do the deliveries. They're blocking um, people trying to exit. They're blocking the part of the travel line of Grove Street. They're blocking the line of sight. Uh, not addressing this is going to re result in trucks continuing to um, use this as a staging area. Well, what they also do now is they come down and they block Grove Street by doing a, a turnaround so they can back in. So this whole area gets very, very congested. And when you're looking at, you know, peak season for the club, it's uh, May through uh, Labor Day. And there's people coming and going all day long. So this is a real, this is a problem. And, and I think getting the granite curve back in there 
I don't know what came out of the uh, review with uh, the town engineer. But they, uh, I thought they were kind of fishing for that as well last year. So that's that's one, one major issue. I don't think I've heard it said tonight, but I think it's been asked a couple of times, what's the seating capacity of the current clubhouse? The allowable occupancy lower is 184. I counted up the numbers on the plans. If I, if I read the numbers correctly, I came up with 350, 351, something like that. Um, so certainly, if all, every seat was taken, that's a dramatic increase. But what I find uh, to be different, I think the point was raised earlier, is uh, potential for additional uses. And then having uh, the flexible floor plan, which is really what they all try to have now, uh, if it's three, Three different dining rooms, or three different defined dining spaces, a larger lounge, the outdoor spaces. Uh, it's obviously a more efficiently designed building, so they can very easily run uh, a function or two functions, two small functions, and serve members at the same time. Uh, they may not want to do that today, but that they would have the ability to do that tomorrow. Uh, it also gives them the ability to. Uh, to ramp up their shoulder season functions and events. They say they're not going to do it, but it gives them the ability to do it uh, with this kind of design. It also uh, gives them the ability to attract a different market or a different niche for functions or events. Not the big uh, functions, not the big events, but you know the the, uh, the businesses that want the off-site meeting, a little uh, team building, you know, play nine holes of golf, play some tennis, have your meeting. That doesn't go on today, but this type of facility allows them to do that. And it puts, it, it puts the, uh, it gives me the ability to have more use of the space on a, on a slow day or a slow period of time. They can't do that, really can't do that uh, with the current uh, clubhouse because of, because of the way it's laid out, the way it was expanded over the full time. Uh, I think Mr. Wesley mentioned the creep factor of how these things get a little bigger over time. Uh, metal parks, uh, facilities, nine holes of golf, the outdoor pool, the tennis courts, those were all in place, I think, by 1960. Yet the clubhouse has been expanded uh, two or three times uh, since then. Certainly had a big renovation and expansion, physical expansion, I believe, in 1970. And in 1995, it was expanded in a different way by constructing a new building on Broad Street and reclaiming the floor space for uh, dining and, and the lounge. So there's there's been expansion, uh, and this would be if they just take the numbers off the plans, a further expansion of, of seating and the ability to do more things with that seating. So that's kind of the the you know the concern of uh, of uh, myself and even even the neighbors too because. More uses, more traffic. Where are they going to park? You know, if they're not using the parking lot today, or they don't have enough parking today, what's going to happen tomorrow? Those are kind of the basic issues. I know there's a lot on the plate, and we'll probably continue to revisit this. But uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay. I just make a point, Mr. Chairman, if you wouldn't mind, just real sure. quick. Um, the special permit in 1995 that was submitted um, and that this gentleman just referred to was for a clubhouse building that was built on the property. It's a separate building. And there was a special permit issue to that because at that time, the board and the planning department determined that because you're building a new building, that that would be a change or substantial extension requiring a special permit. The expansion of the clubhouse that he's referring to in 1995 was 170 square feet, closing in a small porch. No, that's perspective. Well, that's what the decision says. No, no. That, that, I'm saying they complained. The, the, re the pro shop was on the main floor of the clubhouse. Once the pro shop moved out, all that square footage became available for dining in the bar area. And they had a special permit for that. That's what I'm saying. Understood. Can I address the board? Sure. Uh, I've been, uh, my name is Bob Brown. I've been general manager of the past 15 years. And I can tell you, due to the fact that the membership enjoying the club, not increasing in numbers, but just enjoying being at the clubhouse more, our function uh, frequency has 
increased in the 15 years. So I can't see, and I, I would strongly disagree that anything is going to happen that would increase use of the club by people who do not belong to the club. Right now, it's very difficult to hold on to that because we use the club a lot. We have a lot of leagues for our children. There are existing families. They bring their children there. We do a lot of work for you that probably one of the premier clubs in New England. We do a lot for our tennis children and a lot for our, our pool children. So we use the club. And, and the club is very reluctant to let somebody else use it when they want to use it. So I, think, I think that's an unfounded Accusation. I'm sure that when we write a decision that when all of us are, are, are no longer here or no longer involved, that someone else comes along and um, the, restrict, the, the, the use case is clear on what was intended and what was allowed. We're not accusing anyone of, of misleading what you are doing and what you think you're going to do. That's not that's not the case. We just want to make sure that everyone sort of understands what this will allow you to do and what um, it uh, will enable you to do and what it will allow you to do and then what it means for the neighbors. That's really, it's, it's as simple as that. I respect that. It, and I think we took as an action, the most important thing is what exists today? How is it being used? Seating, et cetera, the function areas and then what is being proposed. I think if you saw that, you will understand that we are building a same use clubhouse. So if, if I can, I think there, so there's two, I see two, two issues or maybe three issues here. Um, one is resolving, r resolving that. I do still think that there is a, um, a, a uh, um, driveway, drive access, loading, circulation issue um, around the driveway and the parking and the, the circle. I think we need to um, do our due diligence um, to understand what parking is allowed. I think that um, I think that we need to understand a little bit better about how those truck movements are going to um, be made. Because I think even right the pictures that were provided that I, I'm sorry that everyone else doesn't see, but um, it, it, they show you know lots of cars and lots of trucks trying to access that same 24 foot driveway. And I think that's to me that's the concern. Nothing. I think actually maybe what's here would even exacerbate um, that issue. It's hard to know um, until we get some more uh, information. Um, so those are my, I think that's my sense that so that's where we're at. Uh, yes. Um, just a comment on the occupancy and seating. Uh, under the building code, uh, or the existing clubhouse and the proposed, occupancy is based on square footage per person per use. And the existing club and the new club are almost identical. Seating is different. Seating is a functional issue, not an occupancy load issue. So you'll see maybe on the architectural drawings an occupancy based on the code and based on fire, uh, egress, and door sizes, and egress paths. That's what drives exiting and uh, capacity of spaces, not the seating. What's your toilet capacity? I, I don't have it off the top of my mm -hmm. head. Because that's how you size the restaurant. Sorry. Right? Because you'll be limited by whatever capacity you can fit. So if you're That's providing, right. if you're providing 350 people worth of toilets, then I know something's up. That's right. The occupancy loads are usually almost double what the seating capacity is, because under the code, it's only 15 square feet per person, and in reality, for dining, you really need about 25 to 30 square feet per person. So that's where the differences maybe are, but I think if we ran an occupancy load of the existing building, which is actually more square footage, you're gonna find that it's a higher occupancy load than what we're proposing. 
Looks like four public water closets. Is that right? Four for the public, not including the locker. Oh, the upper floor? Yeah. I think there are four. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Like Four downstairs. Seventy-five to one hundred and fifty per person, depending. Uh, or that and then more downstairs, and they're all accessible. Okay, so we obviously got some more work. And any other comments from the public? Anything new? Uh, I just wanted to clarify, so the information that we're asking the applicant to compile, we said capacity. Do we mean occupancy or do we mean seating? Seating. It's really how they're going to use the space. So, for example, they listed only two spaces, right? They could list all the spaces but say there, will no, there won't be any combination that uses more than 151 people, right, whatever their existing capacity is. I mean, honestly, for me, I just use equivalent numbers. So if you use seating for one, use seating for the other. If you use capacity for one, use capacity for the other, whatever it was. I mean, the problem with event space is you can have three times as many people standing as you can sitting. So we need to make them equivalent right. so that it makes mm -hmm. sense. Right. I just want to be clear to the applicant, in fairness to them, that whatever we're asking for, we're all in a, the board is clear that it, it wants to be either maybe both, one or the other, if, if both would be helpful. I just, yeah. I don't want to get caught up in us asking for the wrong you thing. You mean for building capacity? Yeah, well, we, we, we keep saying we want to see the capacity of the club, the current and the future, defined as, I guess is what I'm, I just want but to sure, clarify. As, uh, as uh, Andrew just said, though, that the building capacity, he has to design his egress for as many people as he can jam into that space, That's basically, correct. and then size the egress units for that. But how they want to seat people and how what their kitchen capacity is, for example, might be different than that. Uh, even the bathrooms. Again, bathrooms only can only serve so many people, and so that might be so it's seated. Capacity. It's fairly wide. So, so you've got this uh, event room, and it opens up to the grill above it, and that's potentially a function. And there might be some members, you know, using one of the other spaces, or you know, you're going to have to tell us how you plan to use this so that that number always stays where it is. Otherwise, it's a change. I think that's mm -hmm. what it comes down to. And whether you justify that with kitchen staff can't possibly support a 300 person wedding, you know, there's no way to cater that, or there's not enough bathrooms for it, or there's not enough parking, all those things. So just outline them. And I think also, so what's the number? You had mentioned that um, the ratio of space to parking spots is currently more. So what's the number being used? Well, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll get which that. like capacity yeah, seating? Let, which one? In interest, let's yeah, just, we I think I think we have to ask. Mm -hmm. Let us come back to you with the appropriate response back to that. Okay, and if we don't get that right, we're going to work with Gene and team to make sure that we get the information that you need. I think the most important thing is existing versus proposed, and we'll take as many potential cuts at that with current bathrooms, proposed bathrooms, how many people can use them. And so. Okay, G. One other thing, uh, off in the corner of the page, not mentioned, is the pro shop. And one of the issues we have is uh, service access, delivery trucks, uh, and so forth. And nothing has been said about service access for the pro shop activity. So if you could fill that in, it would help. Meaning, I'm sorry, no deliveries. Deliveries for the pro shop? Yeah. Okay. Does it have a driveway? Something. It's really pretty small, but the. That's cart. Yeah. It would have to be after it. There's nothing after it. How do you get stuff over to the pro shop? From the street or up? From up? Yeah, from, from, the, from above, it looks like nothing. No, the but question. then there's, yeah. no, there's no truck access to it at all. And then I can see, so. We'll get, we'll, we'll get how it gets done. Yeah, so I, I, I haven't been there when they were in Just to understand the vehicle movement, yep. really. You know, if you've got a truck idling on the street, that's different than something that's being hand trucked over. Okay, anything else? Continue this stuff. 
Can we recap so we make sure we get this right? <laughs> okay. Andrew and I were just comparing notes. Um, okay, so the the um, the ask is for more information first on the capacity, the current comparing the current to the future, and they're going to look at that a couple different ways. Um, the second is the driveway, the access, the loading, and the parking, and a little more clarity on truck movements um, and how the cars and the trucks are going to access this driveway. The third thing is service access, in other words, deliveries to the pro shop. Right. The other stuff was minor, it was sort of. It's a Grove Street issue. Well, I guess we're, we're going to have to look into what the parking regulations yeah. are for that length of road okay. street. So we'll have to figure that out. But there's some engineering that has to be done on what that curb line might look like. And Jack's got some other drainage engineering issues that he's going to resolve with engineering. Okay. Engineering. As you have this one open, I think, you know, looking into additional plantings along that wall, I know that the drainage is right there and it's just the feasibility of it. I do think it's a, it's a reasonable request. On um, top of the wall? Or? I don't know. I can't, I can't tell from the pictures. That's what I'm trying to, and behind the wall. So between the wall and the clubhouse. Between, between the street and the clubhouse. Yeah. We'll read this out. Yeah. Show some evergreen things to be planted between the clubhouse and Grove Street. Right. So, so, um, so this is something to break like that up so a little bit in little, terms so of, and I'm not to screen it off, but to, 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 to break it off some. There'll probably be, I don't know how much nighttime, you know. Dark, you know, glare coming out of those windows, which you don't have now. So they're breaking that up. So I think we offered in one of our butters meetings to get input from the butters on the final landscaping to put in there. It's same reason, obviously, but yeah. 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 yeah, I'm not suggesting a complete, you know, complete buying off because I think it does look nice, but to break it up some, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. What are we hmm. going to August 13th at 8 now. Yeah. August 13th. Okay. Well, I mean, you can certainly we certainly we work back and forth with them to, to get Just something in case. Yeah. Move that the CBD is going to do 745. 745, just in case. Okay. <laughs> On the unlikely <laughs> potential thing that Johnson would get continued again. Sure. Move that the CPDC continue the uh, public hearing for the uh, Meadowbrook Golf Club site plan until Monday, August 13th at 7.45 p.m. Second. All in favor? Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
So came up with the idea of these three parking, additional parking spaces for the employees only beyond the 35 foot zone. The 35 foot zone, which is the buffer zone for the resource area. Now, when we were the one who worked on the certificate of compliance with the Commission, so he came to us, and before we do anything, we prepared a feasibility or a schematic plan and submitted to the town, to all the departments, to Conservation Commission, which circulated between the other departments, including the planning, and <clears throat> we also talked to the engineering department, and they said, should we go spend time and money on this? Should the applicant, the business owner, should have spent time and money for these three parking spaces? And they encouraged us to do so. So we did file this application, revise the plan, these three parking spaces only for the employees, managed by the business, managed by the management and the employees themselves. It's pervious, no change in the grade, no change in the drainage pattern, basically no change to anything on this side except these three parking spaces which can be crushed stone, it can be previous pavement, either or. So that's all. Okay. So after this, we are going to go, of course, before Conservation Commission also, which is day after tomorrow. So we request your blessing. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> Comments, questions from the board? Well, the accessing these the tandem parking places or the employee space would presumably be through the existing uh, final spot, which is identified for employee only. Does would this use result in three additional spaces, or uh, would it be two additional because it would be taking over the existing space for access? I think they're going to use it. They're going to stack them and then move the cars as they need it, I assume. They're going to use all four. Okay. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, hand each other keys and shuffle around as Which they're doing right now. Yeah. So, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, so I, assu I assume that this came out because right now you're parking in the, um, in the, 35 foot zone is that what's happened here so yeah. yeah so which is to the to the left yes. of the mm -hmm. um dumpster the dumpster yep. right so that's the the so well I, I would think that first and foremost we need to make sure that that doesn't happen um any longer We're working with conservation, conservation. to set up yeah guardrail signs, whatever is necessary to be needed there to prevent parking within that area, so. We are proposing a sign, I'm sorry if I may, Mr. Chairman. Sure. We are proposing a sign to be put right here and no parking. We can put mm. <laughs> penalty. How many signs are going to put in this? What's that? Where, where, I'm sorry, where, where did you point for the she sign? She probably said the sign will not work. No, I sign. said, how many signs are you going to put on to the slot? To the left of mm -hmm. the... Yeah, to the left of the downstairs. I mean, to make it official. Right now, I saw the, the, the site myself. Um, Why, can somebody actually park there? I thought the yeah, grade yeah. dropped off. Oh, no. no. I had using photographs it. that they're... You can clearly see that they're, yeah. there's repeated yeah. parking because yeah. there's sand. Yeah. yeah, I can see it. On the left yeah. side there. Up the street. Yes, yeah, I, I, I was there on the Independence Day oh, okay. myself. No, okay. not there, but on the grass. On the grass, yeah. 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 Okay. yeah, well, conservation doesn't want you there, so mm -hmm. don't park there. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I don't know that a sign would do it unless the sign was on post. You know, yeah, but yeah, so you let's not put them. any more signs up. Let's just put a <laughs> barrier. So they look a barrier, barrier, yeah. barrier down low yeah. or something. We could do that as long as we leave enough room for a small blade plow because it's going to be... Is that the storage location? It's, a, it's, a, it's no storage location. No, is yes. it the official storage yes. location? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. On the um, well, side. yeah, I don't want to impede that function either. Um, I don't know. Think about that for a second. If, if I may, we 
We could use a low height barrier where the plow can lift its blade and push over. I have done that on some of the site design I have done for condo associations where there's a slope and they, the plow doesn't want to go down the slope. And so it prevents, um, it prevents for a vehicle to cross over, but at the same time the plow can... How can low? Like two feet? Two feet high? Um, Probably 18 even, inches would be enough. Even six inches enough. A curve, nine inches at the most. What, I'm trying to remember what the drainage. What's the drainage doing? Is it coming towards us? So towards the, the everything is coming to our, yeah. our system here, uh, on-site system here. Everything is coming down. Coming this way. Okay. Eight, eight, inch, eight inches is considered a non-mountable curve. Correct. So anything high, eight inches or above. I mean, I'd be right. okay with that. It's not visible. Yeah. Right. Yes. Very simple. I mean, I don't want something that you know the plow's going to knock over every right. year and put it back every single year. <laughs> so, to me, the other thing here is that you you can't um, plant that those plantings along the edge that you're showing because there's no space for them. That'll take up your you. There is can we this? How many feet did we say from property line to the edge of the parking? We have, um, it looks like it's no more than two feet. You can't fit. I mean, right now there's a fence no, there. That's, I presume that's the neighbor's fence. Um, I think it's. I think it's our fence. I, I I'm not sure to be honest. I don't remember, but it's bending this way. The fence. So I am assuming the applicant put it up. However, um, maybe some small shrubs or. We will try. If you could do it, fine. If you couldn't do it, we won't do it. But we are trying to enhance the area since we are too yeah. close to the resource area. Thank you. Well, I, I guess I would say don't do it because it's going to... Um, you don't have enough space in there unless, unless you have some... Small. Yeah. <coughs> and and at that point, what are you doing? You're screening the woods. I mean, it just looks like there's enough vegetation. Yeah. For vegetation. So okay. I, yeah, I'm not sure what what oh, what their park. function yeah. what their function yeah. is. Yeah. And yeah. as they grow, they're just going to squeeze out the parking and make the parking space yeah. less yeah. likely to be used. Sure. So. I, yeah, that's a high Ooh. fence. That's a tall fence. It's a six foot fence. Yeah. So. You know what's it doing? It's just blocking the fence from the perfecto side. Mm -hmm. It's not really doing anything. I wouldn't put them in. The John's right. Yeah. Let's make the parking work better. The real problem here is something that we actually said would happen. Has looks like it's happened. Is that small granite wall, the retaining wall, um, for the uh, probably um, spaces two, three, four, and five maybe. Um, is yeah, looks like it's all been broken up and that one. isn't functioning right? anymore. Yep, Jeff. there it is. Yeah, because there's not enough space. I assume that people are hitting those that either it wasn't ever yeah. built correctly or people are hitting it with their bumpers. And they don't. Not yeah, work. curb stops or some not wheel not stops nice. or something that there is further to the left. I'm sorry. To yeah. That. I know we talked about this. We totally talked about it. That, we, that, that, that they uh, bought like five feet of space or something. Did that ever go mm -hmm. through? Remember oh, the, yeah. The purchase yes. extra land yeah. on the right side. E-cars. Uh, e right. E-cars. E-cars. <laughs> Back to that. <laughs> Take a second. Right here, we can even put a couple of service stops. Yeah. If you do that a few times, you'll damage your car, so you won't do it again. Well, somebody keeps hitting that wall. The cough is really good. It's, 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 it's around here, isn't it? It's, uh, area. Uh, but what um, about it's the right there. The I can't read the is number. Is that our problem? It's hmm? the wall? second is that our one problem? It's not the employee, it's, it's the second. that one right there. It is right over here. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. We can promise you that we get fixed in two weeks. And as a condition of the last decisions is always to maintain your landscaping. So 
their okay, plantings so. are dying and everything like that with they're working with concom to resolve so, but okay we have no water source all right uh, that's yeah, part of the i think that's what's there yeah. Yeah. For, for which one you talk oh, for Okay. Yeah, all the all the landscaping. There's no underground sprinklers or anything, is there? There is uh, actually not on not underground. No, not no. underground. But we have on surface. And you can see it actually where where the jute mat is all this area. But there's no underground. Yeah. Right. So the, there's no water source for the landscaping. No. no. So we got plants right in front here. Um, who's going to decide what the pervious material is? Conservation? Do they have a say in it? Because, I mean, if you do gravel and pack it in tight enough, it's not really pervious. I would right. think conservation. Yeah. Conservation. Yeah. Fine. Other comments from the board? No. no. Any public comments? Remember to state your name and make sure you've signed in. Public comments on Perfectos. Uh, Greg Jones, 26 A1 Street. Uh, I, uh, A1 Street is uh, around the corner uh, from Perfectos. Um, I'm certainly here to, you know, first state, um, you know, certainly here with some of the members of uh, the neighborhood. We support the additional parking spaces on the site. Uh, however, it's not really solving kind of the overall issue because as it's already stated here tonight, they're already being used. So um, I think the bigger issue for us um, really stems from the fact that you know we're trying to figure out how, I mean, partly, you know, King Pirates is built out, but you know, how a site like this was approved with really what we termed you know, inadequate parking for what the space was used for. And then obviously giving the, the amendment to add more space on the second floor, which would add additional uh, employees. And it's really, our street has turned into an employee parking lot, um, where any day there's anywhere between five to seven employees parking on the street, um, pretty much all day. So it's, you know, I mean, for us, it, you know, it's a negative impact. There's really, I mean, I'm hoping that the CBDC or some some commission, some committee, anybody can kind of come to you know, some alternative resolution because uh, really there is no real resolution to solve the issue. Um, if we have them force them to park their employees on site, it's just going to push customer parking onto our street, which will increase traffic and impact. We don't want to make parking restrictions on the street which will then have a negative impact on us and our abilities to enjoy our neighborhood. Um, so there really is no, what we see, we really have a solution to solving this issue. It's here, it's here to stay, we've got to deal with it. Hopefully, you know, you know the powers that be, folks can kind of put together some creative ideas. Uh, we did see in some meeting minutes years ago uh, about a parking bylaw uh, I think it was in 2012 that was discussed to support businesses like Perfectos who have sites that are don't have adequate enough parking. So how do we mitigate that by finding alternative parking locations elsewhere? I think it was in the meeting minutes of September 24th, 2012. Um, there was some discussions about that, but I don't know where that's ever gone. I don't know if that is really anything that's on the CBDC's radar, um, but you know, it, mm. until there is alternative parking identified for their employees, you know, this issue is just something that us as the residents are pretty much going to have to deal with. So, I think really what we wanted to do is just put it out there that we hope that the CBDC, as you approve new projects, I mean, obviously, parking is a I don't want to talk about it at all anymore. You guys issues with parking. It is what it is. But I think if we can start focusing conversations on how we solve this issue so that it doesn't create negative impacts in potentially other neighborhoods, I think ideally is really what, at least I'm here tonight to discuss or at least put out there for conversation, whether it be between us, other folks, uh, all of you on the, on the, uh, on the CPDC to at least start talking about it again to figure out if there's any sort of alternative solution. Thank you. Okay, thanks. 
Other comments? Joe Westman, 17813. Um, I do feel a need to add a little bit more uh, of why the, the situation needs to be addressed in three spaces that are currently being used don't adequately compensate for cars there. And those cars are there early in the morning. By your employee start times on your table on the left, uh, you've got people showing up at 3.30 in the morning. Um, that's really not going to work in the winter time when the town already has restricted parking and your employees are using the residential neighborhood as a parking lot. So the profits are going to become greater. Um, for me personally, I walk to the train station in the morning. The cars are lining up on the side of the road, so I'm walking in the middle of the street. Right now it's light, but in another couple of months it won't be late. So because of that, I can't really walk on the side of the road. So, but the parking is, is a greater issue. Um, and if CBDC says, sure, perfectos can grow, second floor, third floor, whatever is or is not before us, we allow growth to occur, but do not consider the adjacent effects we're doing a disservice to the residents, such as myself. And, and so, um, as part of this, I'd like to see some special conditions or something that perhaps limit that growth um, until such time as the, the parking is adequately addressed so that it does not create a uh, detrimental effect to the abutters. Thank you. Yeah, driveways are also a problem too because you're narrow street or, or narrow street. You're, you're, you're backed and so you're, you're making it challenging for people with a lot of the driveways. Um, I can address your growth issue. There is no capacity or planned uh, growth for that building, as far as I know. That was it. It was maxed out. Mm -hmm. And um, if you guys want to go over the history of how that got there, um, mm -hmm. I can just tell you one thing. The corner of the building is in the brook. So let's just stop there. <laughs> um, and that's the existing building. The existing foundation was already... The existing building location was very challenging. Just a, a series of, I think, conditions that just made the site very difficult. Now, in the winter, there's no parking on Avon Street, correct? Overnight. Parking. There's no overnight parking. Right. Okay, but that's until um, what time? What's 6 a.m.? 7 a.m. So, so that's a problem because the employee parking starts before 7 a.m. Correct, but they would have to then park either, they'd have to find this alternative parking, I can address that, um, or they'd have to park in the lot. If they're parked in the lot, they'll either have to move or customers will go away. At least at that time, they'll go to the next busy bagel shop waiting <laughs> the street at that one. So that's, I don't know how else to explain what's going to happen to that lot when when and if it becomes so unnatural that people finally just give up on it. Parking, parking is a constraint or can be a constraint to a business and that's really, I mean, you talk to everyone, any business, that's one of their main issues and if, if they're going to take up their, um, you know, if they don't have enough parking, you know, it sort of starts to equalize um, uh, in the long term in terms of customers versus parking spaces. And it's really the only leverage you're going to have to get them to start looking seriously at alternative parking. Um, we sort of encourage it. I don't, we can't really force it to, um, to Greg's point. We can't really force someone to make an agreement for shared parking. And those legal issues sometimes are, have, uh, have killed some options that people were pursuing, you know, because they just can't get the lawyers to agree that they can share this parking and who's got the liability on that. So we still encourage it and we look for it whenever we can. We'll figure out if we can find a way to write something <coughs> about it, but I don't know how we can do that just yet. That's yeah, a I mean, sort of yeah, tangential the, issue. But the bylaw that's, that I referenced earlier, it talks something about having, you know, remote lots that would then provide some, I don't know if it would provide transportation between, I think Melrose um, is a town that does this, they've got certain employee lots for the downtown businesses. Yeah, I know, but I don't think the town is going to take on that. Yeah. You know, that would have to be something that the businesses do on their own. And I think some businesses have already found alternative mm -hmm. parking and yeah. some of the bigger developments have yeah. done that downtown. 
I mean, I think, I, you know, first and foremost, I mean, there's, uh, there's not one of us here that don't want to support businesses and, and support the growth of business within the town. We understand the importance of it in terms of its economic development in the town. Um, you know, and, and we want to support businesses as much as we can. You know, but we also rely on the CBDC and, and, and Christians like like all of you to help make sure that there aren't going to have negative impacts to you know, potential neighborhoods, residents, mm -hmm. and things of that nature. So I, I guess for myself, my biggest thing would be just in the future, and I know all of you have done it, I've watched you know, certainly some of the previous meetings on the TV of Paramount, and it's definitely the conversation of making sure that there's adequate parking. Um, but, you know, I, I, you know, it's just, well, the hopes is that you know other neighborhoods don't you know, have to deal with this issue. With. So, I mean, a lot of us, you know, we've got you know there are a fair amount of homes that are on the street that have you know, kids playing in the neighborhood. And, you know, it's a very small street. I mean, the challenge we have is we can't even get the town to reduce the speed limit for us. So, you know, it's a 600 yard street that has a 30 mile an hour speed zone. So it's. You know, it, we're you know we're kind of backed up against the wall with kind of a no-win situation that, from all angles. And, you know, we're just we're just hoping that you know, that there can be potentially some alternative solution, if not now in the immediate future. At least, uh, okay. Not so distant. Di Sure. Right. Any other comments different than that topic? Anything specific? Jeremy Closure 25. You know, I was just kind of mad at that. Um, you know, they do show up at 3.30 in the morning and they block the driveways. I mean, I've got pictures of cars that are blocking driveway. They're good 18 inches, 24 inches. And so I would just like to know, should we just call the police? Yes. 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 Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Do it. Any other Absolutely. Way that might be helpful to call the police. Call the police. 24 7. Yep. They're, yeah. I, they're not pushing the buck off to, to them. That, yeah, that's just it. how, the, A, that's who can respond it. at 3 30 in the morning, but that's how how we can then get that feedback of how often and, mm -hmm. and, um, sure. and see if there's <coughs> um, other ways to address. Gets the documented. Issue. Absolutely. All right. Uh, yes. Thank you. Well, I I, I knew the, the employee, and I was told by the applicant that then the employees do come to work at three thirty. Uh, I, I knew that. That's how the, the issue of the parking and, and so on and so forth. The justification for the for the three issues we came up. But I wasn't aware about the Avon Street. Um, one thing I can do on my own behalf as the engineer of the record for the site now, definitely talk to the owner. I hope you have talked to him already. I don't know if you have or not, but I would definitely make him aware of this situation. I know we did approach the abutters, the neighbors, the other businesses, and requested mm -hmm. shared parking, and they did not agree. And I also know that he has invested quite a bit in trying to recoup and get back on his feet because he just started. But at the same time, I personally am uh, going to make sure that I do talk to him about this, make sure that the situation will be really amicable to everybody, especially the residents and mm. neighbors. Uh, okay. <coughs> Part, so I have one more question. About the three spots, how is the snow removal going to happen from those? And when we get in the winter, are they going to have to respond to the park yet? Or are they going to have to snow pile from the spots? They'll have to pull it out, I guess. Yeah. Pull it back. Pull it back and put it to the left. Oh, actually, this, this part has a snow storage right over to the left of it. Yeah. My recollection on this, and I may be wrong, but I think based on how small the snow storage spaces are, my recollection is that there is a commitment to, um, to um, remove snow if, it, if um, there's more snowfall than they can fit in those spaces. So um, this, this would just go along with that. They'd have to pull that out, put it in those snow storage spaces, and then mm -hmm. when that's too much snow, they just need to cut it off. Yep. So. Mm -hmm. Which is happening more and more in Reading. Mm -hmm. Gotta get rid of the snow. 
Now, you said the uh, owner approached the uh, butter businesses. Did they also approach 295 Main Street, the condo apartments? Uh, I am not sure, sir. I don't know. But I know the neighbor to the right. 281, yes. Yeah. I yeah. So there does seem to be, you know, a relatively healthy parking lot behind the apartment building. That if it is, you know, during the daytime, could be more empty during the day. So to rent out daytime spots may not work for the 3 a.m. shift. But, okay. And so my question would be to Jean whether that's allowable if the spots, like can you rent out spots? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Like that? Sure. But the yeah. most we can really do is in our, in, in our uh, oh. decision is just encourage them to approach the yeah. neighbors right. to the north there mm -hmm. you know, yeah. to see if they can figure out a timetable for using some of yeah. their spots. There are any know. number of of ways that they could do shared parking, yeah. uh, off-site parking. We do allow it under zoning. We change the zoning to include that yeah. provision. Okay. Right. So um, it's something that we would encourage. And I, I know we've talked about it with some of the other challenging sites. And um, you know, the other alternative is like we've done with the other business that had some overflow parking. Is if the neighbors, I, and I think what I heard is they didn't want this, is to um, perhaps look at one side of parking, you know, restrict the parking to one side only, on street parking, on Avon Street. We did that on um, Hopkins. Could you go to sticker parking? Can yeah. yeah. we do resident sticker? Uh, no, it was just uh, parking only on one side. Um, this was when Sam's Bistro, you might remember, um, and it was a sa similar issue. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had they, it has to go through the Board of Selectmen. They're the roadway commissioners. Um, but that is one alternative to pursue that through the proper channels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think for us, you know, we, we would advocate against that. Exactly. That's, you know, it's a double-edged yeah. sword. Well, you, you, need you need the parking. You need the parking. The residents need the parking, so you can't give that up. So yeah. potentially a sticker type situation. Right. That's another alternative. You know, well, then, I, you know, for us, it negatively impacts us because then that reduces our ability to entertain, have guests, um, you know, because of its only certain parking. No, but it could be, it could be worked out, I think. Yeah. It could be something mm -hmm. where... Yeah, you know, there's like, other neighborhoods that have it. I mean, you could theoretically do something like sticker parking only prior before 8 a.m. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's... So that it would be hours plus sticker. Mm -hmm. You can start the conversation and see if you yeah. can figure yeah. something out, but it's got to start with the board of select. It all has to be public hearing, and yeah, it's, it's beyond what we can do here. Okay. Uh, if there's nothing else, um, just like to close the public hearing. We get a motion to close the public hearing. Oh. Close the public hearing on this item. We haven't forgotten you. We didn't forget you. We gotta go home, it's late. Yeah, we'll close that one and open it. Move that the CBDC close the public hearing for um, the property at 285 Main Street. Second. All in favor? why I can't find my decision. No, here it is. Let's talk about conservation. We want to add a condition that just says that the applicant should continue to seek uh, alternative parking solutions. Mm -hmm. You want me to put in there that con con will decide the previous material? Yeah. I'm sorry, what was that? 
at ConCom will decide the previous material? In the past, remember the building yeah. inspector wouldn't accept certain materials yeah. because they couldn't, I don't know, they couldn't help with calculation or something, but I think we've moved forward from yeah. Mm -hmm. More materials are allowed. Okay. Is that all we have? Yeah, that's all I have. Well, in the current uh, <coughs> decision, it says no site signage has been approved. Uh, page three. Here in. Conditions, yeah. Do we need the signage for the no parking or any other anything else? I thought we agreed we were just going to do some sort of a curb stop some barrier, or some yeah. sort of barrier. Okay. Okay. So we need the here. signage. Part of engineering. Yeah. Do we add the curb stop language? Yeah, I'll add cur curb stop language in there as yeah. well. Okay. An engineer can look at that. And then does number five under findings need to change then? A no parking area has been, oh, I'm sorry. No parking area. Oh, no That's parking fine. area. Yeah, I'm sorry. I That's I fine. I read that to be signed. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> oh, signage, an app. Yeah. yeah. So I'll remove that. Okay. What about the condition of getting the wall repaired mm -hmm. in advance of the building permit or I don't know how we want to um, there needs to be some uh, there isn't going to be a stop to prevent. Yeah, there isn't going to. I don't think there is a building permit for this. Nope. He's just doing site work. Mm -hmm. right. No, no, no there's no building permit. Oh, yeah. That's the, the only thing I can but think is zoning enforcement no, on the previous condition to maintain landscaping. Uh, I mean, you could have a condition here that says that the applicant shall maintain their the wall for safety or something, yeah. for customer safety. If it's falling, is it falling this way or is it falling that way? It's, it's getting pushed. It's obviously getting right. pushed onto the abutters yeah. property. But then there's loose blocks laying around. Well, but that, isn't it covered by the general condition number one? I think it should be called out. I think it should specifically okay. say something about yeah. repairing yeah. the retaining wall. Yeah. That, that, you're, you're responsible for retaining walls that are pulling up land on from the side, property. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I understand. Just to add that. But my understanding is that's the condition of the original permit. Right. The original site plan. Right. Right. So either staff has had not applied to enforce it or has had resistance enforcing it. Well we don't really know how long it's been broken like that, do you? Mm -hmm. No. Oh, it's no. No. weeks. Well, weeks is not really that long, but I understand. Right. So just to condition <laughs> it under that they should uh, repair and maintain yeah. the retaining walls per the original application. It's just this is an opportunity if you continued the hearing until the wall was fixed, you have an enforcement mechanism. I know, but what are we trying to enforce? They're going to give us three spots. We can't get any more spaces. You know, you want to fill in the book. I'm all yeah. for it. There's there the stacking yeah. units. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, you put six cars. Anything in. else you try to do on that site is going to make parking worse for the yeah. customer. Correct. Right. Yeah. But you could park some more cars head in on those across in front of the dumpster, but then you're playing this whole game mm -hmm. of moving yeah. cars every yeah. time the dumpster has yeah. to be I'm, empty. I'm just there. trying to get the wall repaired. Yeah. That was it. Well, well they're also going to, I mean, they have some landscaping um, maintenance that needs to happen, so mm -hmm. there's going to be some zoning. Mm -hmm. um, Enforcement, yeah. yeah, review of of that. Yeah. The other the yeah. other alternative is to do it outside of this decision and have the building inspector follow up. <clears throat> so I guess well, we need to strike um, finding number eight. Yes, we're not going to do that. <laughs> Planting. Yeah. 
and then in the um, in the engineering's memo, there's a statement that said parking space 18 and 19 should be confined by granite curb or guardrail, um, which I agree and I guess is covered in here. This says, in general, throughout the project, the applicant shall work with town engineer to address any outstanding concerns mm -hmm. um, in the letter. Um, so I believe that guardrail will also be Concom's area. Mm. Okay. We're sort of kicking more. that over to, <laughs> to engineering and Concom. Right. Well, but I mean, engineering's got a list of yeah. requirements yeah. here. Yeah. So we're saying to conform to this memo. I'm fine with that. We're just kicking everyone. Yeah. Other requirements. Good. Other boards. <laughs> <laughs> Good government <laughs> work. <laughs> But those, those, engineer, those engineering comments are really having more adverse <coughs> impact. They, 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 like I said, we did talk to the assistant town engineer, and the concept plan was very similar to this. And at that time, there was no question of granite curving here. If you put granite curving here, you're causing more disturbance. It says, uh, it says granite curb or guardrail. Such a limited space, you want to you plow. I mean, I really think right, the guard rail the so function of the guard rail. The guard rail is to no keep storage. those cars from parking. Right. Where so what, the, what, what no one wants to have happen, I think, is they don't want space 18 to become space 18 and space 20, which is then <laughs> two tandem spaces. And, and then and then have parking in that buffer zone again, right? I mean, that's let's call a spade a spade, right? right. That's the issue, is you, is keeping cars out Keep of that buffer zone. Okay, yeah. okay. that's yeah. that's <laughs> at gray. So, if I mean, yeah, um, we can put at gray the um, wheel stopper, okay? Because if I put a grand curve, that means I have to touch a gray, dig. And raise and disturb the grade. We moved away from the granite curb. We said the guardrail. Yeah. Right. <coughs> some barrier. How's that? Okay. Some barrier. Okay. Three, two uh, by you'll three work it out with engineers. Yeah. Because yeah. right. yeah. you're going to do the same kind of barrier over on the other side too. To right. 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 Yes. Yes. Something. Exactly. So we do it. Well, eight inches. Eight I'm inches fine. or more. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. For the snow removal. Yeah. yeah. That way we don't have to touch the grade. Okay. All right. So just to review again, language on curb stops, encourage curb stops. Concom will decide the previous material. Um, encourage them to refer to neighbors for shared parking. I'll remove the signage language. I'll add language to repair the retaining wall and remove finding number eight about the signage again. Right. Great. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Good motion. Move that the CPDC approve the site plan review decision for the project at 285 Main Street, Perfectos Cafe, Taj Engineering, as amended. Second. All in favor? Great. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. Please don't forget to go home. Okay. 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 You ready? Yeah. Yep. Just gonna right. hold it up. Uh, notice is hereby given that pursuant to sections 4.3 and 5.3 of the Town of Reading Zoning Bylaw, and in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 40A, Section 9, the Community Planning and Development Commission will hold a public hearing on Monday, July 9, 2018, at 7:30 in the Selectmen's Meeting Room at Reading Town Hall, 16 Lowell Street, to consider the application for a special permit to allow, to allow a live-work facility within the site. <laughs> 
located at 400 Main Street, Assessor's Map 17, Lot 26 in Reading, Massachusetts. A copy of the application and associate documents are available to the Public and Public Services Department in Town Hall on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. and on Tuesday from 7.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. Thanks. And as I noted before, the associate member is eligible to vote if the full-time person is not capable of voting. Just in case anyone has an objection to uh, her not being here on the open meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I already own the salon, which is underneath at 400 Main Street. I own the salon and I'm rented out right now. The landlord is selling the building, and I'd like to be able to live upstairs with my son. Um, it's not convenient for me financially. My son won't have to switch school districts, and um, I feel that I meet the criteria for the special permit. And I've never done this before, so if I'm doing something wrong, I'm not You're saying the right thing. You're good. Okay. You're good. So, in section 4.4.51, <clears throat> the property is su property is suitably located in the neighborhood in relation to the entire town. Um, it is suitably located for the residential and commercial use. There are residential homes and condos nearby, and businesses already within the area. 4.4.52, the proposed will be compatible with the existing uses and other uses permitted by right in the same district. It is in the DSG district, I don't know what that means, but <laughs> which does allow mixed use. The only difference is that I would be living there instead of renting it out. The salon business below is also allowed by right in the underlying business, zone B, and would not be detriment in any way to the area. 4.453, the proposed will not constitute a nuisance due to... Can I, can I just move that we don't just read through yeah. these? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Why don't we just sure. talk this through? Sure. I, I need to know what I'm doing. <coughs> You're, You're good. Good. Okay. Yeah. Great. If you need pictures, um, I have... Um, you have this one up there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not one of the other ones, but it's, it's a little stew. So currently, what's happening upstairs? Is no, there's there, nothing up there now. What's it? Is it, it? it it's just a bunch of broken up rooms. I don't know what they used to do. Okay. What, 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 it used to be dust busters. Yeah, the clean, yeah, yeah. clean yeah. happening. I offices upstairs. Uh -huh. When I originally bought the building, I was going to put my business there. But um, it was just a little too small. And so I said, I let me rent it out. And about a year and a half ago, Jen came and went to the first floor out. Spent an incredible amount of money making it beautiful. Had all the proper permits pulled, had the inspections done. And if you go inside, you'll see it's really nice. Mm -hmm. And I was going to, I said, I know what, maybe I want the second floor, but then I was like, oh, then I have to get something for that whole general business because parking's an issue. I said, uh, I said, Jen, I'm going to probably sell the building. And if he sells the building, I'm not going to get a nice landlord stack. <laughs> <laughs> so I might as well just buy the building and live there, right? So Jen was like, well, you know what, I'd like to buy the building. I said, well, there goes the real estate commission. <laughs> so let me just, so here we go. So your request is to be able to live in this building. Mm -hmm. And I've, I see something separate. You've got one business there that's the salon. Are you also ask, asking for a separate permit for the jewelry business or not? No. I have that's I have a website. Okay, so you're not looking website. for a storefront for that. No, 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 no. no. Okay, that's I have fine. a I have a separate oh. website for that. I'm a busy girl. But um, the upstairs I just want to be able to, you know, do some remodeling, some, you know, remodeling and you know, put a kitchen in the bathroom in and live upstairs. My son's 13 now and it's just easier for me to be <coughs> home from school and he wouldn't have to change school systems and financially being a single mother it's just it just would work for me. Is this parcel land actually in the downtown mm -hmm. smart Mm-hmm. It is. Okay, it's in it's in the the, the corner of, the, of our most recent like expansion. Last, last one. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's good, right? That's yeah, good. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> I was surprised to uh, to find that. So, how many cars actually fit stacked 
behind the res the personal parking. Can you get three? I'm getting one. No, I'm getting one behind there, and then four on the other side. Yeah, no, but I'm not. I'm just thinking about the so the residential use would park to the right. To the left. Yeah, the residential. The residential. So you live in the spot. Yes. So how many spots can you get in that area? Can you get just two? Two. And the live work is allowed. And we think the four can actually fit across the CPDC. Yeah, it's this was I know it's possible right, because this is well thought out before we did the building over. Yeah. Comments from the board? Staff have any issues? I don't. It's <coughs> just the definition of the live work special permit, making sure that residential use is not really a known commodity, I guess. I don't have the exact definition in front of me right now in the decision, but um, incidental and secondary to the commercial use, so how do we kind of ensure that? Which I guess is what we showed through the access, that it's not really, the residential isn't accessible mm -hmm. exactly through the um, salon. It actually is. It is accessible, but not for customers, no. that right. it would be right. kind of closed off. And I'm not sure what the meaning behind that is. But yeah. does, I'm not sure that would even make a difference. I don't think no. so either. So no. it's, it's just the, a But it's not always the case in some yeah. of the businesses that are currently. Oh, I understand what you mean. Meaning, like, there's no one from the outside that have I have to get it's like somebody puts a salon in their basement, so you oh, come in yeah, the front yes, door yes, and yes. go downstairs, that right. kind of thing is, is different. Yeah, that's, Andrew, what's the risk of it not being incidental? I'm just trying to see the flip side of, of Um, I guess I'm not really sure. You start getting uh, businesses happening in residential neighborhoods. Right. Right. That's the problem. Right. But I'm just trying yeah. to understand. Yeah. Okay. This is yeah. in a business district. Got a it. real business in a house as opposed to just Got it. Some, what's allowed for some Right. Way. right. So yeah, but here a live work is specifically commercial with the residential. It's not residential with the commercial. Right. Or or commercial space, what is, we want to be commercial space being sort of, I'm going to say, taken over by uh, um, a residential mm -hmm. use and the commercial space being token so that they can locate a residential unit in that property. That's clearly not the case here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, this site has really good exposure. It's a horrible intersection, obviously. It's like the worst <laughs> intersection. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We watch outside, I'm like, oh, God, this yeah. is another accident. But it's good. I've never had a problem going on me because I'm used to it, but it definitely does. Quick kind of professional the, business of being a witness. The Absolutely. To, the ability to use it this way almost guarantees that that business will at least survive somewhat because there will yeah. be some investment in it. Right, that's what that I said. Yeah. Renting a storefront and it doesn't work out, you just kind of move on to the next mm -hmm. store. But with her and both, it's almost going to be maintained. Mm -hmm. right yeah. Right. Mm. yeah. Oh. Well, I think it, it's clear that this request meets the definition of the live work facility. Yes. So. Um, and it's clearly uh, a, a eligible for principal use in the district. So, looks good to me. <laughs> well, I would say the incidental use would be that the owner of the property or, or the business is the one who's residing there as opposed to renting out an additional apartment. No, I, I, I understand that. But if you were to go and decide you wanted to move, mm -hmm. the question becomes would you be eligible to rent out the top floor as a residence? Okay. Um, is that possible? I mean, not that I'm planning on doing that, but in the future, what if I... I don't know. That's, that's that one resident, of the questions for the board. If that resident had a business on the first floor, they could. Correct. Yeah, because yeah, if you rent it, it wouldn't be live work. Yeah, you'd right. have to right. rent it as a whole, okay. you know, to the... To the in the same combo. Below, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. In order to... Yeah. Keep so, if, so, say down the road, I decided to keep my business and rent out the upstairs, I would do it. Would it be possible to apply for another special permit, or it just isn't possible at all? Is my question. Um, I don't know that the upstairs could be used as an apartment. I is mean, if true? it's DSGD, it can be DSGD. You have to look at some other mechanism. I mean, obviously, I would close the door to my salon off. Right. If that was the case. Right. But I think the DSGD requires a certain um, 
density for the lots. Yeah, right. Which I don't <laughs> think this would meet. It's nuanced. We went through this with um, uh, the dentist when she was going to put a couple of units up above, and we checked back with the state, and subject to their approval, it was possible. That's all I wanted to know. I would have to come back and all that. It would, this would involve the state, so I, I don't think we could say for sure one way or the other. Well, not for sure, but it, it, it's a possibility. <coughs> but this is a long way down the road. Yep. I just, yeah. I just I, wanted to just have my own personal. Yeah, I think what we can say clearly is that this property could be used if the owner lives and and works. Yep. In, you know, takes yeah. up the whole yep. space. That we can say. That's permissible. Yep. If, um, if the bottom floor is used like you're doing and the re the top floor is an office or something like that, that's permissible. It's yep. the it's the case where, you know, you would want to keep the, the salon as you have it, but rent out the top floor as a uh, residential unit, mm -hmm. we're not quite sure whether. But it's not impossible if I would just have to go through a lot more. <coughs> we don't know. Sure. We don't know. Very yeah. I wouldn't count on that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, if you well, don't count on that you're safe. Right now, what you're asking us to do yep. is allowed. Is yeah. fine, yeah. And so that's, that's what we are. <laughs> And on your behalf, I assume you already have a P, uh, purchase and sale agreement with the current owner? Happy this meeting. Yeah, I, I, just, okay. I, I had to get this yeah. approval before I could do anything. I've been on hold. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to have to. I won't say why I asked, but <laughs> I won't say why I asked, but that's for you guys to work out. Okay. <laughs> uh, any public comments on this? Okay. okay. Andrew, good job. Thank you. <laughs> Helped out a lot here. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so I do think, though. I, um, so um, I think it's important in this um, in this condition, in this case, that it that it maintains the outward appearance of, of a of a. Um, commercial business yeah, and I think that's a yeah. I, I, I think you'd want to do that Absolutely. but I think that's a condition that we need to put in here um, that's a good point. you know I, I don't know how old your son is but if they were small and then having toys and stuff and that you know you don't want that for He's your business key, but so. yeah <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think that that's the I think that's the case where we need to put the condition in here that um, it still maintains it still maintained the outward appearance of a commercial business yeah. okay well, actually, so, I think it's as, mm -hmm. is maintained as a business. Isn't that the whole point of live work? If you close the business, can you have somebody live work? Well, y yes, but I, that's two different things. Right. Yeah. If it's, they close the business, then it can't necessarily be, be live work. But they could keep the business open and have, the, have it look like a residential unit. Okay. And that's, that's what I'm trying to get yeah. at. All right. And you, you wouldn't, but you yeah. just want to put that in here. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> I think the decision covers it. Yeah, there is. Did you have some? Oh, is it? Language under on page three, right? The language zoning by law 5.3, that second bullet point as property, as owner of the property, I would ensure this is not the way we write decisions, though, right? I mean, the yeah. property owner shall ensure yeah. something like that. The owner of the property shall mm -hmm. ensure. Yeah. I have. Yep. 
I, I would just offer maintenance consistent with um, the commercial use is maintained. Oh, I thought we had that on the condition. Uh, exterior, uh, exterior shall be maintained. The shall be approved. Business use. Yeah. Like that. Where's that? I thought we were adding that because you were adding that under conditions. Uh, All right. You asked to have Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll keep that in the condition. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And then you know how loud it gets, correct? I mean, you're there during the day. I live in a townhouse now, so like, it, it, I, don't want, I at least don't want that neighbor. But, but the trains mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I work there all day long. I don't even hear it. Believe it or not, I don't know what they <laughs> do to this building, but it's pretty sound. I don't know whether it's the cement, but Good. it's pretty soundproof. Good. Yeah, I'm That's very good. aware. <laughs> Probably the closest to the train tracks in Reading. Possibly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the brook. I never hear no, the river runs. The, oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. Yeah. Don't forget the car wash. The car wash. You're right. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> All right. Talk okay. Get okay. a decision. Uh, get a, uh, sorry, close the public hearing. Move that the CBDC close the public hearing for the Live Work Facility Special Permit at 400 Main Street. Second. Favor. Okay. Move that the CPDC approve the special permit for the Live Work Facility at 400 Main Street, Spiritual Diva, as amended. Second. Favor. Thank you. Good luck. Yes, we did. <laughs> Good luck. Thank you. I'm gonna go with no. Good night, thank you. Thank you, you guys. Okay, um, you got anything else that's important? Lot release. Lot release. <laughs> you get the candy bar. Good luck. Three parties. Thank you. Bye bye. Yes. Okay. Um, then we have the master plan. Then we have design guidelines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, no. Two sets of minutes. <laughs> I've been going to bed at 9.30 for the past three weeks. Oh. Just to get ready for this week. <laughs> yeah. 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 What do we know about this? Anything, any comments from engineering? Yeah. Um, they issued the house numbers today. Okay. Or actually, June 28th they issued it. And he's still working on the driveway approvals, and those will be probably tomorrow or Wednesday. Um, Taylor's first name is Mr. Cole is out. Chris. Yeah. I just have a curiosity question. Are the pl plots themselves pre-sold, or are they being built on spec? Yeah. Like a townhouse. Okay. okay. Um, how many copies of this do we have to, do we have to sign? Just I only gave you one, yeah. That yeah. Okay. So can we get a motion to fill the CPDC to endorse the slot release? Um. Way. Move that the CPDC endorse the three-party agreement uh, lot release for um, Veterans Way. Second. All in favor? I wish they 
know what <laughs> yeah, this is pre-notarized? Um, from the bank and her oh. party agreement. I think you guys sign one page and get notarized on it. Right, right. Yep. you'll sign it and Kim will notarize tomorrow. So we're going to sign right here. Yes. Making sure this is like the only copy we have. It's all in box. <laughs> Where do I put just down below? Just right, just right there. All right. Okay, I see. I'm going to try and find a separate one. go for me because I don't get to do anything tonight. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Updates to the master plan. For real. Quick, brief. Leave that in the talk about? Um, sure. I just wanted the board to put that on there because there's been, I know we talked about it a little bit last uh, meeting, and um, there's been some more discussion. And I thought if this is something that CPDC is interested in, we should start planning for it. Um, I would want to do a little more research, but I've done some preliminary research on what the cost would be for a comprehensive master plan update. Um, and it ranges depending on how much public process you want to have. Um, my concern is that um, no matter what the amount of money is, that we would want to have some pre-planning before we go out. It, assuming we have the money to do a master plan, I think we'd have to really think long and hard about what we think we can accomplish in a master plan. Um, there's been lots of discussion across the community about the kinds of things people are interested in seeing in the community. And um, to, to start a master plan process with a committee and end up with a master plan that ultimately doesn't get adopted by town meeting would be something I'd be very concerned about and I can cite at least two examples of when how that's happened in other communities where they've spent a lot of money and gone through a lot of um, planning only to have the plan fail and um, since it seems like there's a wide variety of opinions about what the future of the town is it seems like having some sort of public process to at least vet generally what people can agree on um, before we <coughs> jump into a master plan so that we okay. that can all be done by volunteer town folks. Absolutely. So more of a, a visioning kind of a, a thing, what do we yes. want to be when we grow up Yes. Um, in, in general Yes. Um, given all the different Friends that are happening around us. Yep. I, I guess I was, well, obviously I wasn't here during the last meeting, so I wasn't part of that um, discussion, but I guess I would think that taking on a master planning effort now with um, a lot of 
potential changes that are going to happen, um, especially in the downtown in the next three years, um, I think would get very, is it just a, uh, is a tough time to do it because the messages and the changes will be very reactionary, um, hmm. I would think. Um, that was exactly my reaction. I think that at the moment, we don't know what it looks like to have three new developments right in the downtown. Then in the next couple of years, they will be in the process of being built. And so we still don't know, but we are grumpy with construction. Yeah. And so until after a couple of them are online and the town feels its new character, and can kind of try those clothes on, I think is probably a better point in time, but it does feel like this is not the right time. Unless you did, I mean, something that Vanessa said, like the select, I mean, the select board could do is honestly like an annual input process where we could, you know, the town can say, who are we, who do we want to be, that will build into a master plan and what are the problems that we need to solve? Yeah, and so and it's, it's like an annual process and people get used to it and they start feeling that their voices are heard. But it, the planning doesn't actually you know, sit down until after, I'd say, at least a couple of them are online mm -hmm. and occupied. Yeah. Help me out, Dean, with the memory. There, we had some number of years back the big... Uh, World Cafe. Talk at World Cafe, whatever it was at the high school. Um, That's before my time, so it had to be over 10 years ago. Oh, okay. I've been here nine. Hmm. I mean, it was right before I got that. here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's true. Yeah, because the. Um, I'm not sure I understand exactly what you know constitutes a quote master plan with capitals. Um, and one of the things that we have been perhaps um, failing to get done is periodic review of where we are relative to an existing plan. Now, as we have a plan, we mm -hmm. have the. the um, planning material. I mean, we've done it some number of exercises on a regular basis. Yep. But I'm not sure I remember going back and comparing where we are now with where the plan suggested we might be heading. Well, well I thought we did do that. So the master plan, the existing master plan was approved when? 12 years ago? 13 years ago? 2006. Okay. So, and I, I guess I thought, and we must have been on the same board, because <laughs> we, um, I, I remember going through, and this was back when, uh, who was on the board, um, not Jonathan, um, John Sasso. Yeah, John, John Sasso, Sasso was on the board, yeah. and he might have even been the chairman. That we went through, we we had all of those goals that came out of that master plan, and we had tracked those, like so that it set up the agenda for the following year. I remember doing that maybe two or three years, and I think it, then we got so busy that <laughs> we, we can't. We just need to get them. <coughs> development through forget about planning looking forward um, but we did do that for a yeah. while my guess is that if we did go back and look at that master plan that right that some of those thoughts are now so old um, that well, we've, <coughs> we've advanced past those yeah I think some of it may have been overridden slash by the smart growth activities some of them were, some of the points that were brought up in the master plan were um, addressed by the smart growth. Yes. Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. And the economic development component of the master plan was de most definitely the springboard for an economic development action plan. So we tackled, I that feel like that right. section <laughs> as its own standalone action plan for economic development. We did a lot of work on that. A lot of public forums mm -hmm. and, and visioning. Mm -hmm. 
Um, same with the housing component. We've done two housing plans that have been adopted by the state since I've been here. And the we're a model. Plan, yeah. We're a model community for for smart growth. And we get reports on production here annually, anyway, right? I mean, you report right. Where, right. where we stand. On yes. The production. Yeah. But Reading is is. I have been invited to represent the town of Reading at public, at affordable housing seminars and conferences because people want to understand. I was just in the town of Belmont mm. a week ago, week, how did week you and a half ago, done, yeah. and <laughs> they wanted to know how did you do what you did in Reading? You know, how did Reading accomplish what they did with affordable housing? So um, a lot of work has been done. And we're recognized on the Commonwealth of Mass <laughs> website as being a 40R smart <clears throat> growth model community. So it's not as if we haven't accomplished anything. Um, it's just the master plan, which it'd be great to, you know, I'm a planner, so of course I love this stuff. But, um, <laughs> but you just, that's why I want to have discussion, because you, to just jump into it, Without really thinking about it, I would hate to spend that money. Yeah. It's a lot of money, and it's a lot of resources. You know, where it's Andrew and I right now, which is great. But um, you know, you hopefully, have to yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I wouldn't want to take it on and only do, you know. No, no, we have to see it through. Yeah, yeah. I'd want to do it the right way. But in the same token, we have some. I think the town has things facing it that we need to be able to manage. Yep. And one of them that we know is sooner than three years is going to be the Amazon. Is it the Amazon project? Nobody knows who's going to get it yet. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. The project that it Headquarters number two, Headquarters Amazon number is looking two. to add in 50,000 employees. Oh, it's going over here and running. I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, expect it Somerville, Lowell, and Boston. Yeah. Ever. But how, but even if the facility isn't here. Sure, absolutely. The there will be some fallout from that right. that well. will impact. That 50,000 oh, yeah. high level jobs are going to be looking at Andover, Reading, North Reading. Mm. Right? Well, we already have the busiest commuter rail station on the line. That's right. Right. So that's an, that's the infrastructure to be able to handle yeah. any in increase in building, apartments, <clears throat> use of the train, and all of those. I think I think rather than put it off, we ought to say these are at least the topics that mm -hmm. need to be addressed. Yeah. And I I think that would, I think it would be healthy to do that now yeah, rather than wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you're I'll right. Help you. You're right. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I just there's, if you don't, be more there's going to be more drive to build in these communities that, oh, that you're building up, and hopefully it won't just be apartments. Hopefully it'll be starter homes and some better variety. I saw the legislative agenda that's coming out. Yeah. Some of those, some of those items that they want to push, you know, so hopefully it'll be better than just you know, what they've been pushing lately. You know, and, and we well, we have basically in the, in the approved project several hundred units yep. that uh, are yeah. in the in, if you will in the construction phase. They're at least on the planning board. Yeah. yeah. In front of us. Um, I don't think we should put it off. That's my feeling. Mm. But that's yeah. different than a master plan, right? Right. right. Yeah. That's I, very well, different. I agree with right. The conversation so, is not right. a plan. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. The, I, I guess what I what I hear you saying, and I think this is a, a, a useful conversation. It's a little different than a, vi a vision plan. It's the let's let's look at either the re whether you call it reality or a likely future. It's scenario planning in, in right. essence. Let's look at the scenario that um, that Amazon comes or that there is a uh, significant a unit. Is significant drive to have more um, demand for for more housing right. uh, in Reading. How, well, what are we going to yeah, do? Significant growth. I mean, which yeah, includes, yeah, so, yeah. includes the education and public services and 
uh, residential. Yeah. How do we want that to, to look? Hmm. And I, I don't know if that's a. Um, I don't know if that will create more um, problems in the sense that if that type of growth doesn't occur, then we're just then we're stirring things up. Well, the problem is, as you saw from the legislative agenda from um, the select board, is that Boston is growing. It's not an it, it's not a question. It is growing, and the yeah. problem is they need a spot for people to house, and they can't live in Boston because it's yeah. too expensive. So they're pushing them out as far out as they can, and Reading happens to be in the sweet spot. Yeah, you know? yeah it's certainly one of them. So we are going to get that growth because Boston's got the growth right now, and it's exactly. not an issue of if; it's when. Yes, sir. Right, we're going to get some of it, and we don't need to accommodate all of it. So right. that's why we need to decide. You know where are the priority zones and, and what's the capacity that could be handled even with some infrastructure growth we're certainly not going to widen you know 28 to put up housing up and down south, mm -hmm. uh, south we're gonna main street shrink it and ruin the road diet well you know if we talk about satellite parking we do need to have light rail to be able to get there though know, people are saying there's no Triangle. place to park hmm? Master plan for the Green Triangle, <laughs> Reading Station, <laughs> always two, comes plus back the parking to that. Oh, I, I, what's you that don't need a parking garage. You just park at Jordan's Furniture. No, shuttle them down. No, because we're going to have we're going to have basically like an assembly road type <laughs> development. There. They need a station good. plus a parking garage. Well, assembly like road, yeah. assembly road. The buildings include the parking garages. I know, but ours is different. Ours is a different plan. <laughs> is this where the current <laughs> DPW area? Yeah, yeah. Whole, yeah. whole area yeah. down there. Yeah. I'll put a train. Yeah. Train station train right goes there. right by it for some convenient reason. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so we we probably need to identify some of these things, it's, which will eventually make their way into the master plan when we get around yep. to it. Yeah. How yep. do you respond to the mm -hmm. following changes? Yeah, sure. yep. Yep. And I think there's a way to do it without having it be disaster planning or you know or creating a situation where anxiety is raised. I think, I think the economic forums were quite good in that sense, in that it was a little bit of like, what are the issues, but what are your dreams, and what, what would be great? So. Sure. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not saying that we could reverse engineer it, sorry, I was going to say, uh, just the way we tell somebody that their parking capacity limits how much they yep. can do, we could decide that there's a capacity for year or long term, and that's all we're willing to sort of take mm -hmm. on. That's enough for us. So. Mm -hmm. Sorry. And that'll work until 2022. Were you looking down? Were you looking down? I just was wondering if anybody in the audience maybe. <laughs> Anybody? Anybody? Public comment. Last topic. Great. Um, there has been some just floating discussion regarding updating the master plan. It's not on the select board agenda yet, even though it has been mentioned in our meetings. Um, I know that our LDA is in discussions about how they can work with the town. Um, given the services that they provide, um, electric vehicles or something, that are actually have something on the percent um, tomorrow the select board meeting, which is, can we put it into our policies that charging stations are necessary for any major new developments? That was before by David Talbot. Um, so that was an interesting one. So it might, I, I don't want to jump the gun because the select board hasn't discussed this as a full board yet, but this might be an area where Gina can make a great point about not about allocating funding and then moving forward with the master plan without having an idea of what all of these boards have to say and what all of these volunteers can contribute. Um, so that might be a nice first step, getting a subcommittee together. Um, but again, I don't know if that's, that's my yeah. thought personally. It's like we haven't made a decision on that yet. Um, but I, I do want to discuss if not spending that amount of funding without having an idea of what we're going. We're all on board, though. We're all on the same page, though. Good. Yeah. Thank Thanks. 
You made it into the minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we need to get to? I think we're good. Good. I think I'm perfect. <laughs> <laughs> get a motion then. Are we going to discuss guidelines, design guidelines? I, I think it's... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have to, uh, be honest I, I have with you, I'm so busy that I'm um, not having... I only got I language a from small language mm -hmm. from Jonathan Barnes and Pam, and yeah. I added it to the Word doc, okay. so yep. it's okay. there in the drive if you want to review. Right. It wasn't anything major, I don't think, so we can continue discussion mm -hmm. next meeting. Yeah, I'll do that. And if you guys send language, I'll add it, of course. I think I need to have a discussion with you guys before I put language in. Mm -hmm. called No Pink Buildings. Uh huh. <laughs> no pink buildings? Kidding. Yes. Samples. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Pink buildings.